evening and welcome to the Thursday, December 12th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Um, I am Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the school committee, and I will begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Mayor David Narkowitz? Present. Uh, Ms. Rebecca Busanski? Present. Ms. Laura Fallon? Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Present. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? Present. Mr. Downey Meyer? Mr. Howard Moore? Yes. Ms. Susan Voss? Present. Mr. Ezra Howard? Present. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now begin the uh, portion of the meeting where we have public comment. We have a sign -up sheet. I did want to let the public know that this meeting is being audio and video recorded by Northampton Public Media. Um, we have one person who is signed up to speak, uh, Jeremy Whelan. Hello? Uh, Jeremy Whelan, unfortunately no longer a Northampton resident, Amherst, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, but I am a technology teacher at Northampton High School. In my capacity as a high school teacher there, uh, I just wanted to, I shared my sentiments with the superintendent on this program, but uh, I had the uh, absolute pleasure of teaching in the Twilight program. The Twilight program is the after school pilot program that went on at Northampton High School, which specifically targets individuals who have dropped out or are very, really, really close to graduating. Uh, the, I, had two I had two students in this pilot uh, class. One is, is currently still taking it. One just recently graduated. She allowed me to, to share with you her story. Uh, this student uh, dropped out two years ago after becoming pregnant and having a baby. And the tremendous responsibility that was over that two years uh, really started being compounded by the idea of going back and uh, not only having to take care of this child, but then being you know, quote unquote, too old to be sitting in classes with some uh, underclassmen. Uh, so this program provided her an opportunity to come back and fulfill one of her goals. This was one of her goals because she is actually the first in her family to graduate from high school, which was really, really profound. Uh, I got to know this indiv individual very well over the weeks that we spent uh, together. Um, and in doing so, one of the things that we did was uh, she actually asked, you know, what can I, you know, I, with my diploma, what can I do with this? Uh, and what does it get me? And so we quickly looked up some data and statistics. And on average, in the United States, a diploma versus a non-diploma will get you $10,000 more a year. Uh, and so just looking at the financial uh, data here, um, we also looked up the, uh, the percentage of uh, individuals that drop out after pregnancy. 40% make it through after becoming pregnant in school. Uh, so she was behind the ball in all sorts of data here. Um, and the, when she graduated, we had a little party with administrators and, uh, and uh, just family. And we looked at the pictures that she took over that time, uh, landscapes and uh, different light paintings and different techniques. But most importantly, it was uh, when we went to Child's Park and we were taking pictures of her child in Child's Park for our portraiture. And so uh, she brought her, uh, her, her son uh, to her little graduation party. And one of the things that she was really looking forward to uh, was, you know, kept on asking me was, can I walk across that stage in June? Can I walk with my, with my baby in June? And um, it was just such a powerful moment for me. Um, I've been teaching for six years, and it was really, really um, awesome to see. Uh, and so uh, it's a pilot study. I know I've been throwing data out, but how can you measure uh, success of somebody's life? Um, and so thank you. Thank you for taking initiative on that. Thank you to the administrators at the high school uh, for really pushing these students and encouraging them to come back, to come back after you know, some quite reluctance. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I would also like to uh, thank Anne, Anne Hennessy. She was the representative from the board here. Uh, she worked with me. Uh, it was her last meeting tonight, right before this. Thank you for coming. Uh, for Northampton Open Media's board of directors. Uh, just in that meeting alone, we actually uh, uh, voted to approve the purchase of a closed captioning system that will not only go to closed captioning of meetings like this, but also will aid our schools in the transcript and the captioning of other things. So really cool things going on, and I appreciate um, some of the initiatives that uh, have been taken recently. So thank you. 
Thank you very much, Jeremy. So there's no one else signed up. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment tonight? Okay, thank you very much. Um, next we have um, announcements. Are there any announcements from the school committee tonight? Okay, no announcements. Um, uh, then we do have a consent agenda of recommended actions. Uh, we have the approval of the minutes of November 14th, 2019 of our school committee meeting. Um, there are no budget transfer approvals. We do have um, two field trip requests. Uh, one is the JFK Wright Flight Program at the New England Air Museum in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, January 30th, 2020. And then NHS going to the Yale Model United Nations in New Haven, Connecticut, January 23rd through the 26th of 2020. And I would entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. There's been a motion made and seconded. All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. We now move to our reports and recommendations, and we'll turn to our student representative, um, Eleanor Harden. Um, so we, me and Izzy have been mainly focusing on, you know, this whole survey of um, later school start times, but the student union has still been really working hard on a bunch of different other issues. Um, mainly since the last time we spoke, um, we completed and analyzed a survey of the whole school. Um, that was meant to try and gauge students' opinions about various issues in, within the school. Um, we asked them about, um, you know, their opinions on climate change and how that should be, you know, if they wanted that to be um, part of our education. We asked them um, just about uh, class sizes or if they wanted to, if there was a specific class that they really wanted to add. Um, to the to the, um, the the class list, and so um, and then we also asked them to rank their um, top issues out of a list of ten. Um, so the number one ranked issue was um, racial inequities. Uh, number two was sustainability of the school, and number three was the school start times. So um, this information, is, like especially the ranked. Uh, part will really help the student union kind of move forward in creating like a main goal for this year and what we want to accomplish um, and kind of guide, you know, the different projects that we work on. Um, I think it's important to note that um, we've done this survey or a similar survey, one that included the, uh, the ranked ranking of the different issues at the school um, for two years now, or this is our second year doing it, um, and last year racial inequities was our number one issue as well. So this is the second year in a row that that's happened, and I think it's something that you know the student union really wants to focus on um, because it's such a it's obviously such an important issue for students. Um, so yeah, that's that's one of the main things and um, that we've been doing. But we've also um, just received two applications for our. Uh, grant process or, or grant applications. Um, the student union has decided in the last year to give grants to different clubs or projects um, in, within the school that we think will help, you know, will one, benefit the community and two, be like, you know, just have a lasting effect. Um, and so we received um, grant applications from Best Buddies Club and Model UN. Um, just to help, you know, and and yeah, so that's where and we're kind of in the process, I guess, of deciding who to give money to, how much money to give them, and um, you know whether we want to give money to both or just one, or um, yeah. And we also kind of discussed at our last meeting that it seems like the people that are applying for these um, grants are really just they're applying for just to keep their club or their you know whatever they're doing like alive to work towards this, you know, to work towards whatever their you know, mission is, um, which we hadn't initially thought of as what we wanted the grants to be for. You know, we wanted them to be for more new innovative projects, but it this, this is making us kind of look back and think, you know, is that really where the, our money is needed or is there a better way that we can advertise these grants so that 
you know, maybe students who are doing a capstone project and need their need more money could apply for these grants if you know know that these grants are available. Um, just different, you know, we're kind of just still in the process of like critiquing this application and, and figuring out what exactly we want our money to go towards. Um, we also are still working on this sex education curriculum project, um, and it's I think it's going to be not as much of a, a priority as it was last year, but it is still continuing, and we have two incredible students, um, Brandon Kamini, who are really working hard, and, you know, working with the teachers and the administration to figure out, you know, what's the what to do there. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of the, my summary. Thank you very much. Thank you for your report. Okay, um, next we have a report um, from Ananda Lennox, who's going to make a presentation to us on the Prevention Needs Assessment Survey, the Annual Prevention Needs Assessment Survey. So you just have you to get to, the Do you want me to help you with this? Yeah. Sure. I'll, I'll be your advancer. Oh, thanks. Is this, am I coming through loud enough because I'm not? Just for the TV. Oh, so I don't need it. Okay. Has <laughs> um, everybody on the committee um, seen the prevention needs assessment presentation before? Like, are, oh. it's not like I need an overview or anything. Like other years, you mean? Like, do you have new members or anybody that wasn't here back in 2017? Uh, well, we probably do, but you might just want to give a brief uh, overview well, just for the just, general public. Yeah. 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 So, what, what I was going to do that I don't normally do is I brought a copy of the survey and I'm just going to pass it around so when I'm talking about it you'll have an idea as to what exactly it looks like so I don't have to go through 121 questions. Um, so, and did everybody, Annie, everybody has this stuff, right, like the addendum? Okay, great. Okay. So, uh, thank you for giving me some time at your meeting. My name is Ananda Lennox. I'm the coordinator for the Northampton Prevention Coalition. And John, if you could advance the slide. I have pretty basic goals for the evening. I'm going to try to take up about 25 minutes of your time unless there's questions. And um, I'm going to do a basic overview of the trends that we saw for our 2019 prevention needs assessment in regards to substance use. There's definitely a spotlight on vaping. Um, we see substance use go up and down from year to year, but vaping, um, I, you know, in an odd way is kind of reaffirming for our survey because a lot of times people say, oh, this survey, how accurate is it? It seems like maybe this should be higher, this should be lower, and I think everybody's in agreement that vaping has exploded, and that's exactly what we've seen on our data. So that's, if there's one good thing about it, it's that. And then I also want to discuss implications and next steps for the schools. So thanks, John. So um, I always open with this slide. You might have to click it a couple times for all of them to show up. That's it. Um, so the, I always do this as just a reminder as why do we care about this? Because there's so many things to care about when we're talking about education and youth. But when it comes to substance abuse, um, there's so much research now just indicating that it takes um, root during adolescence. So it's a lot of pediatricians have gone so far as to define it as a developmental pediatric disease. Um, and if there was, you know, any advice I'd give to anybody, it's just like if you can put off trying these things until your mid-20s, your chance of developing a dependency or an addiction is almost nil. So that's the main message we're trying to promote to parents, youth, schools, all sorts of stuff. Um, and that's just because the basic biology of the developing brain is more susceptible. Um, we also know that substance use gets in the way of students reaching their goals, whether it be their social emotional ones, their grades, their college attainment, all that sort of stuff. Um, so. We want to make sure that we keep an eye on this so that we can help prevent those negative outcomes. Um, please. So a quick overview of us as an organization. The Northampton Prevention Coalition is a grant-funded um, organization. We have a bunch of different sectors that work with us. And our mission primarily is to reduce and delay teen substance use. And we serve just Northampton youth. Um, we collect and share data, kind of like what I'm doing tonight. I do this with schools, with parents, and with students when they ask for it. We promote evidence-based practices. Um, we do a lot of social norm campaigns to correct misperceptions around substance use. And we try to connect various agencies and institutions with the resources they need to promote overall youth health and well-being. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to go over today with you is the Prevention Needs Assessment Survey. We do this throughout Hampshire County. Spiffy oversees a lot of them. Um, we survey Smith Oak as well, but for tonight, we're just looking at Northampton High and JFK. We survey the 8th, 10th, and 12th graders, 
it is optional, but most students generally opt in. And this year, this past survey we did in March, April of 2019, 499 students participated. And um, just a quick note about why we do it in March and April is there's two definitions that we use when we're looking at youth substance use. One is lifetime use, which is a question about have you ever. And then we also ask about regular use, which we define by past 30-day use. So we always make sure that we're careful to conduct the survey at a time of the year where it doesn't cross-sect with like a special occasion or a holiday where there might be an increase in partying or exposure to drugs or alcohol so that we can get just a flat line rate. Next slide, please. So just like a good positive social norm campaign, I'm going to start with the good news because I think schools always need to hear the good news and students need to hear good news. So next slide, please. So the best piece of news right now is that most Northampton teens do not drink. And we know that alcohol is one of the most commonly abused substances by adults and youth alike. Um, and I put a little sunny spot over the senior class because this is the first year in a few years that we have a majority who are not drinking regularly. Um, usually we're looking at you know, 46% or 48% say they haven't drank in the last um, 30 days, but right now we're nearing 57%, which is excellent. Next slide, please. The other thing is that we get this information from the prevention needs assessment. We have two ways that we ask this question. We ask parents in a brief survey if they allow drinking in their homes, and then we ask students on the survey if they are able to access alcohol in their home with their parents' permission. And the vast majority of students are not getting alcohol at home with their parents, which is really good news. It means that they're social norming and being concerned about youth development, which is great. Next slide. The other great news is that most Northampton teens are not using marijuana. Um, we always want to see these numbers higher, but again, um, our 12th grade saw about a 16% drop compared to 2017 for our senior class, which is great. So now 64%, almost 65% are not using regularly. And um, sophomores have stayed about the same, and our eighth graders have stayed about the same. Um, next slide, please. And despite the huge problem with vaping, the majority of teens are not vaping regularly, which is really good. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not a big problem, but the majority are still do not consider themselves vapors. Doesn't mean that they've never Rose tried Bennett, it. Please come to the library. Rose Bennett, please come to the library. But we still have to focus on the positive here when we're looking at changing social norms. Okay, next slide. So now we're going to segue into trends for a minute. Next slide. So this is just a slide to show you all the things that we ask about in regards to substances. So tonight we're focusing on alcohol, cigarettes, e-cigarettes, and marijuana, but we also ask about inhalants, hallucinogens, cocaine, methamphetamines, prescription stimulants, prescription sedatives, prescription tranquilizers, heroin, and prescription opioids, because these are all things that we need to be informed about. The great news for our schools is that generally all of the higher, like, more dangerous drugs have generally just been blips on our radar, which is good. We did see a slight increase in prescription stimulants for the sophomores and the seniors. And when I say slight, we're talking low numbers, but we're talking 1.7% up to 3.4 and 2.7 up to 6.3. So just something to keep an eye on, but still a very small number. And then that messy circled area is just our, those are our big drugs that we track very closely. And we have seen increases. The red arrows are increases. They're not all very large, but there was definitely an increase for eighth grade for alcohol and e-cigarettes and marijuana. We saw a decline for seniors in alcohol and marijuana, but we saw increases for e-cigarettes across all grades. And I'm going to segue into trend data right after this so that you can see, even though there are some increases, the trends are actually looking pretty good for everything except e-cigarettes. So next slide, please. So cigarette use, good news is it's still trending down. It's not trending down as high as, as well as we'd like to. We're definitely worried about this just because e-cigarettes have reintroduced nicotine as a substance that youth are you know, getting addicted to. But the trend is going down, so that's good. Next slide, please. The other is alcohol use is trending down, which is nice to see. Um, alcohol is like just a very prevalent um, entry level drug that we always keep an eye on with teens. But right now, we've been seeing the rates go down, which is good. Next slide. Vape use, um, probably not surprising, is trending up. Um, we started tracking this in about 2015, I think it was. We didn't really have data in 2013 and 15. I think we might have had lifetime use, but not 30-day use. This is 30-day use. And the rates are definitely going up for all three grades, um, which is why we're going to spend some time on this this evening. Next slide, John. 
And marijuana is a bit more of a mess, so <laughs> I did a different type of slide so that you could see the trends are still stable, maybe slightly going down, but there's been a bunch of bumps, um, especially among our senior class. But the good news with them is in 2017, they were hovering around 52%, and this past year they're down to 35 and a half, which is great. Um, but you can see if we go all the way back to 2007, <coughs> they were at 40% back then. And there's been a lot of changes in our community since then with decriminalization and the dispensary and then the legalization and the medicalization. So there's been a lot of stuff happening. Um, sophomores have stayed pretty static. Um, there was a bit of a bump in 2009, but they've been staying in the 20s range. And the um, eighth graders were keeping an eye on, they are trending up right now, but it's still not that far off from 2007 data. So this is just not as clear cut as some of the other ones, but definitely not too worrisome just yet. Next one, John. So the other thing that we ask when we look at all this data, um, especially when I'm presenting to schools, because schools are just such a place for students to come together and spend time together, and they can share a lot of great things, but also some bad habits, is um, how are these substances being accessed? So next slide, please. So. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of different slides, and I'll go through them relatively quickly because I broke them down by substance, but what you're going to see um, that trends throughout them is that what, what we're finding with almost all of these is that the primary way that students are accessing substances is through social access. So with alcohol, you know, there's a certain percentage that do get alcohol from their home without their parents' permission, so those are the ones that would be sneaking it. There are some that are getting it from their homes with their parents' permission. And the questions aren't nuanced enough, like we don't know if this is like a religious event or a special dinner or anything like that, but this is what they're reporting. Some are getting it from a non-parent family member, but by far, they're mostly getting it from someone over 21 or someone under 21, which is how we measure social access. They're getting it from their peers. Um, and still, there's a large number that didn't drink in the past 12 months, so that's also a good thing to point out. Next slide, please. Access to marijuana is a lot clearer on the social access thing. You can see the bars at the bottom. Uh, the majority of students, if they're using marijuana, are accessing it from a friend. A few uh, seniors have a much higher percentage of saying they're getting it from a dealer or a stranger. And then there's a smaller percentage getting it from a family member, from someone with a medical marijuana card. And in some cases, they grew it or someone in their home grew it. Um, and then a very, uh, then a little bit are getting it some other way. Next slide, please. For prescription drugs, before we get into this, because there's one, that one bar that looks huge, I want to point out the information in the top corner, which is that the percentage of students who have never used a prescription drug without a doctor prescribing them is actually quite large. So the majority of our students, like nearing 94% of our eighth graders, have not been misusing uh, prescription drugs or our 10th graders or our 12th graders. But when they are, again, it's social access. They're getting it from someone they know. Um, the next largest percentage is at a party um, from home without my parents' permission. And this next one I want to read with caution. Uh, an eighth grader, obviously, they're put from my home with my parents' permission. And my gut is telling me that's most likely like a student that was sick and a parent you know, gave them something. But I could be wrong. But I just think, again, these numbers that we're looking at are really tiny. So don't, um, don't inflate them in your mind because the the numbers in the top left corner are more important. So, and then vape products, uh, far and away, um, social access, um, I borrowed or used to friends is by far the most popular way that they're getting them. Um, there's, again, someone, I gave money to someone over 21 or I gave money to somebody under 21 is social, a form of social access. Um, there's a smaller but, you know, not insignificant percentage that are getting them online, some from a convenience store, some from a vape store, which surprises me, um, and some have a family member getting it for them and from some other way. The reason I say a vape store surprises me is just because they've been so much pressure to card and do whatnot that I think it's, it, it would be wildly unpopular to sell to youth right now, but I guess it still happens. Next slide, please. So I don't have answers to this, but I just wanted to say that social access for, for us in this position with the data just raises more questions. We can see that they're getting it from their friends. Um, the good news from this is that it leads us to see that like getting, like they're not getting served at our bars, they're not getting served at our restaurants, but they are accessing it from friends. And especially when it comes to vaping, what it, the questions it still leads is just sort of like, well, how are they acquiring them? Like they're getting it from friends, but where are these friends getting it? Is it primarily online? Are they going over state lines? And, and that's stuff that we still need to dig into more. Next slide, please. 
So um, I have a couple slides here that are a little bit out of order, but I just wanted to include them because I realized the other ones didn't point out some things I wanted to. This one's looking at marijuana use rates and perception of harm. In, in public health, what we've noticed with substance use over the years, and it, it, it proves itself year after year, even though sometimes there's a delay in the data, is that when youth perceive a drug to be less harmful, they're more likely to use it. So there's a certain level of substance use that's associated with risk taking, but it's not wild risk taking. You know? So what happens within a community, and you can see this in vaping nationwide, is that when something is pitched as fun and social and cool to do, and is pitched as having relatively zero health effects, then you see really high rates of use. And I like this slide here just because in 2017, you can see that's the lowest point for our seniors as far as, like, is marijuana dangerous? And they're like, eh, only 23% think so. And then the use rates goes up to nearly 52%. And then by 2019, we're back up to 29.8, think that there is some harm with marijuana, and then you see a subsequent drop in use. So this is just something I like to show to point out why social norming is important, public health is important, providing education, getting parents on board with the same messaging that the teachers are doing, because it really does make a difference. Because youth are young, but they're not looking to generally hurt themselves. They're just looking to experiment. And I think if we can just impress upon them the certain dangers, they're less likely to use, at least not to the rates that are going to get them into trouble. Next slide, please. And the other thing on marijuana that I want to point out, mostly because the cross-section with vaping is so important, is that one of the things with having marijuana legal now is just that I think youth and adults have been introduced to all the varieties of ways that you can consume THC. So smoking it is still the most popular, but you can see now that eating it, drinking it, dabbing it, which is a dabbing is a form of highly concentrated THC um, that can look like a wax or sometimes like a almost like a candy. Um, but the, after smoking it, the next most popular one is vaping it. So we're having issues with the vape device not only delivering nicotine and aerosolized chemicals that are bad for your lungs, but it's also a really convenient and discreet way to ingest THC. So next slide, please. So um, next session, I, I have a few slides on vaping, and I'm going to mostly conclude with like what our next step should be. But in case you're not familiar, these are the variety of ways that vapes can be sold. And ironically enough, this slide doesn't include Juul, which is unfortunate. But um, I think Melinda Kalianos might stop over later tonight, and maybe she'll have one on her. But next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> not because she used it. <laughs> <All right. laughs> it so um, lifetime use of e-cigarettes is staggering. Um, you know, it went from not existing in 2013 to our seniors are hovering just below 50 percent. Our sophomores are around 40 percent, and our eighth graders. Um, I have a ninth grader at Smith Folk right now, and I still think of that age as so young. Is around almost a quarter have vaped already, um, which is really. Uh, a, a testament to really good marketing and really terrible um, lag between public health and what's being sold to our youth. So next slide, please. What are they vaping? So this is one of the questions we ask. Um, again, starting with the positive, a vast majority have never used, which is great. Um, but the students are reporting that they're vaping juice with nicotine. The second most common is marijuana, honestly. And then vape juice without nicotine, which is a complete misnomer. Um, there have been studies done on vape juice that are advertised as being nicotine free, and the vast majority actually do contain nicotine. So whether that's intentional, you know, we can argue that, but um, it's definitely an effective way to get kids hooked without thinking that they're going to expose themselves to nicotine. And then um, tobacco, uh, something else, and I'm not sure. So, um, so that's what's going into the vapes. Next slide, please. And this one, I, I still find this disturbing. So I have a note to myself just so I can com make a comparison for you. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Do, 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 vape use. So substance use is not like new among youth. Like we know that they get exposed and we know that some use and we know what the risks are for some. Um, but I think what sometimes what I find still shocking is like the comfort level that students have with using certain substances within a school. So if you look at, so we ask questions like, have you ever been drunk at school? Have you used marijuana at school? Have you vaped at school? All these questions. And so the data that we're looking at here, 8.7% of our eighth graders have vaped at school. 
29% of our 10th graders have vaped at school, and nearly 34% of our seniors have vaped at school. And we also ask them how often, and so some say once or twice, but the vast majority of seniors, about 16, almost 17%, have vaped 40 more times at school. So that's like just what they do. And in comparison, like drinking at school, 0% of 8th graders reported being drunk at school, 1.8% of 10th graders, and just 4% of seniors. And marijuana, which is the other big concerning drug, higher rates but still lower than vaping. 2.7% of 8th graders have been high at school, 12.8% of 10th graders, and 22% of seniors. So vaping has blown it all out of the water, um, and certainly, I mean, just has to be reined in and addressed. Next slide, please. So this is what we know about vaping in our community right now. And again, we're talking about our two schools that we're looking at tonight. Um, by far, it's happening in the bathrooms. Um, it's a social activity. I'm not hearing a lot of reports of people doing it solo. It seems to be a group event. Um, there's been complaints by students and parents alike about the bathroom doors being propped open, um, privacy issues and stuff like that. Um, anecdotally, a lot of students have seemed to have grown resigned to the vaping happening in the bathrooms. Like there's been an uproar and then kind of a falling back and um, it, it's kind of sad that they're just sort of like this is happening. And the other thing I've heard, this is not in our data set, this is just again through conversations with people that friends are seeking help for friends but actual student vapors are not actively seeking help, at least not in the school. Next slide please. So this is an example of what NPC and the schools either combined or separately have done so far. So the bathroom doors have been propped open. That was done because when vaping first started becoming a problem in the schools, that was the area, like that was the environment in which the problem was primarily happening. And so the bathroom doors being propped open was a response to how can we make this seem like more risky so that they're not as likely to engage in the behavior. <coughs> The other thing that happened is the code of conduct had to be updated because vaping didn't exist before. So instead of just tobacco, we had to include nicotine delivery devices and all the different incantations of them. And then regular, regular disciplinary actions for students caught vaping are still in effect, just like for any other substance. And then the, um, oh, you're running out of battery. <laughs> and then the addition that NPC was able to do is we've provided funding for something called eCheckup to Go, which is an online self-assessment that students um, caught vaping or using marijuana or if there's um, any kind of like dating relationship violence or accusation there's also one on sexuality and these are for students to go through confidentially and look at their like for in this example for vaping look at their use what they're spending on it and see how they compare to national norms they also get a referral to Kathy Goodwin Boyd and um, there are many more things the school can do, which I'll go into the next slide, but right now that's what's happening at the high school. For the middle school, I'm not as familiar with how they're handing disciplinary action, but I know that they have um, opened up their seventh grade science classroom to us each year, and so NPC and the Smith Vocational Health Tech Shop go in and we do a day-long um, vape education to hopefully get to them before they're introduced to vaping. We've also done billboards, posters, social norms, and a written appeal to parents in several different formats. One was through a formal letter asking them to help us enforce the rules around vaping within the schools. Next slide, please. <coughs> What's happening next, um, we just kind of had this miraculous coming together of all sorts of people in power, which was amazing. Um, I was talking with the 84.org, which is an organization that helps to educate youth around big tobacco tactics and also promote youth leadership. And they had this vape survey that the state was putting out with about 44 questions on where are kids acquiring it, what sort of cessation do they need, that sort of stuff. And the superintendent, Lori Valencourt and Leslie um, uh, Wilson were all able to um, administer it to their students just last week, which was great. There were some problems with the site crashing because I guess it wasn't designed to handle 900 students in a day or 600 students in a day. But the good news is we got at least half of the Northampton High School students to take the survey successfully. And we're talking 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. So we're going to have more vape data coming out soon. It includes questions that our survey doesn't have, which I'm really excited about. And because of that, some of the students that I worked with around that um, are interested now in starting an 84 chapter. It hasn't began yet, but I'm hoping it will. Oh no, we're out of slides. Um, so that's almost the conclusion. So I guess the last thing that's missing out is just for further suggestions, um, 
I did want to say that you know the vape epidemic that we're seeing in Northampton is not unique to the nation. Like you're not alone. We also you know we survey all of Hampshire County, and there's about 3,000 students covered in that survey, and the vape rates are pretty much identical. Um, I have seen some smaller differences, like sometimes if you look at Smith Vocational High School because they have a different culture and a different system and students have to want to be there, like it's kind of a school you apply to. I think they have a more punitive approach, which in some ways in their culture works. Um, but I think for the school with vaping, um, we definitely need parent involvement. Um, it, it would be, I think, very unpopular and just impractical for staff at the schools to physically search students whenever they come in to look for a vape device. Um, but we could certainly enlist the help of parents to like really uphold the substance use policies of the school and try to their best to keep these devices outside of the school walls. Um, and certainly more education around this would be great. Am I running short on time? Okay. Um, and uh, I think you know, the MIAA has a lot of power when it comes to consequences and holding students accountable. And I have heard of schools that are now using MIAA for all um, students. You don't have the same um, taking them out of the sport for a few sessions or, or something like that. But it does even the playing field for questions around why do athletes get treated so strictly and other students get away. And some of the things that schools have put in place is re like, referral to treatment, like mandated referral to treatment or mandated meeting with a parent for 90 minutes so that they have to become involved. But I think, um, I think because of the public health risk, especially with the deaths that have been happening, the fact that we know nicotine is one of the most addictive substances out there, that those types of movements are probably the ones that would suit the school very well. Um, the other thought I had that's not evidence-based but seems to maybe be fit the culture a little bit better is since this is such a social activity, is consider offering some alternative, like a student lounge that has snacks and cough drops and gum and other oral fixation type things. Um, and considering maybe having your school pediatrician have a standing order for nicotine patches if it comes to that. Um, and we're certainly willing to work with the schools on promoting cessation tools because there are a lot of things out there now. And I've heard from students that posters aren't really getting the message out there, but perhaps a combined effort of parents, teachers, and staff, we could have those students that are coming to us concerned about their peers maybe start taking action with their actual friends who are vaping to get them the help that they need. So um, that's all I have. And we're out of power. So. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone have questions <coughs> for Ms. Lennox? Uh, um, I was wondering, when I was looking for the, the survey, you asked a lot of questions about family dynamics and interpersonal relationships and dating and community um, yep. relationships. Does that, is that entirely separate or is there any sort of correlation with use and those factors? As far as yeah, I think I have, um, what I did for tonight just because I was presenting to school committee, I was looking at school factors and how schools can be agents and change. But yes, um, family dynamics, like family conflict is a very big factor in substance use. Um, family history is a big thing. Um, any kind of stressor can increase a student's risk to s turning to substances to feel better. So when you're looking at possible preventative measures, I mean, is that something else that we could be addressing? Well, yeah, we could, um, I mean, it's like parent outreach is always tricky. Um, we've done, like the coalition has done stuff like that, but yeah, the school could totally have um, family dinners, um, anything that connects, um, like there's a strengthening families program that East Hampton has been pr promoting for a long time that is evidence-based and has been shown to really help um, family dynamics. It's designed for parents with kids ages, I think it's nine or 10 to 14. Um, so yeah, there are things out there that can really help families um, feel more connected, and that does reduce substance use. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Ms. Hennessy. I guess three quick things. Thank you. That's sure. Really I work in a high school, so I see that it's like, I, I love the meme, um, who put the bathroom in my vaping room? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Um, yeah. But I guess the things that I find really interesting is like we haven't, you know, having grown up, I, I know what alcohol is like and pot, and I kind of know some clues. Yeah. But it, vaping hasn't caught up, so I didn't know what a jewel looked like. Like, I'm looking up stuff, right. and I think right. a lot of parents really do need that education. Yeah. I think the second thing is I, I don't like that it's punitive with students, although I do think that is something that prevents kids from doing it. But I find a lot of my students are really having a very, very difficult time quitting. Yeah. Um, and I, I love your idea of possibly offering some alternative or some 
Well, my slide that couldn't show, I have had a consultant approach me. I can't, like, I haven't vetted him. I don't know how to vet him because this is outside of my wheelhouse, but we've been offered um, cessation hypnosis sessions for free, yeah. two of them. He can do 20 students at a time. Student, parents can stay in the room if they'd like. And we have some of those things being offered to us. Um, what I haven't been able to garner is like students kind of coming out of the woodwork and stepping forward saying, we want this. Because if I can get that, yeah. then we have some resources that are available that would be willing to come to the school. So that would be great. And the last quick thing, I, I do think it's a, an also an adult problem. So I know kids are seeing it in their home much more. Right. Um, and that, you know, I think that that's just, we're in this education um, yeah. learning curve right now. And there, it, there is a connection, but um, I don't have the data on me, but the national data shows that still, by and far, the age groups that are using it are our ages. It's yeah. like 14 to 25. Yeah. Like the rates of 25 to 44 year olds and 44 to 60 year olds was like, really tiny mm, okay. so it really mm. is um, that's why Jewel's been under fire it's just yeah. sort of like oh we never marketed to kids and you're like well interesting yeah. Yeah. thank you very much sure yes yeah I think as a student union we're also seeing how like or that like what's work what has been put in place at the school isn't really working yeah. you know like locking the bathroom doors open has made like a small impact for the first few weeks and really hasn't changed anything. If anything, really made things worse because now students are using the actual stalls to vape and so it's blocking the actual access to the toilet. So um, it's, it's kind of become an issue in that sense and you know posters and other things like that aren't really noticed by students I guess or don't have as much of an impact as you know maybe they should. Um, and I think, you know, we're also like concerned about using punishment as some sort of way because I'm not sure, you know, if that would actually stop students from vaping, you know, entirely. And it's like that's the real issue is that it's more of an addiction, and you know, they're they don't know, students don't know where to get help or you know how to stop. And I think that's that's kind of the most important part is you know. You know, there is that aspect of they're doing it in school and that's against school policy, but I think the more important issue is that it's happening in general. And, you know, we need to try and combat that if we're actually going to make an impact on students that they shouldn't be in school. I think I, my counter argument is that they're equally important because I think if we can't help the students who are addicted, then they're going to have a lifetime addiction. But if we also can't keep them from introducing and sharing and promoting it to their friends, then we're never going to get out of that, that right. right now that it's we're in. Cycle. And so I think I do feel, I mean, this is just, you know, I think for environmental policy and policy, like schools have every right to enact rules around like what we deem safe to have in our hallways and classrooms and what other students should be exposed to. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, the ones who are doing it because it's not a choice anymore s definitely need help. And we just need to find a way to get them to feel comfortable enough to come forward and get the help that they need um, without feeling that they're going to be punished to get help. You know, I think it's a different scenario when you're getting in trouble because you're vaping in a bathroom and you've been asked not to versus saying, I can't stop doing this, please help me. Right. You know, I think that if we can provide that, that would definitely get us on the way to making a dent in this. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah. Yep. Mr. Kaufman and then Ms. Foss. Um, thank you very much, Ned. I, I know that this is a really comprehensive survey, and you've done a really nice job in kind of simplifying it in sure. 25 minutes. Um, so I had a couple of questions. I see, obviously, we have some good news here with the trends during yes. uh, specifically alcohol, cigarette use. Um, ink pot is a marijuana is a sketchy. Early. Yeah. yeah. But so as those come down and vaping goes up, is that a, is how much? Are those two things correlated? I mean, I look at the numbers, but in, in reality, are kids using vaping in lieu of the others? Or is, is there a relationship with one going down? You know, um, going up in your mind? I don't have, you know, I wish there was a question we can ask that would be like, has this replaced your use of something else? We yeah. don't. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, from what I've seen in the data is that vaping is definitely just trending. It's taking yeah. off. It's a different type of drug. It's a stimulant, right? So like alcohol is more of a depressant. Marijuana is psychoactive, but it has a depressive quality. 
Um, and I can see how vaping would be attractive to youth just because you're always kind of asked to be on, right? And so then you're taking something that's kind of helping you be on. Um, the concern I have with vaping increasing is that with the sophomores and seniors, and I put that on the addendum, that jump in RX stimulant use, I was kind of wondering if those two were connected because oh. you're getting a taste of the nicotine, which is already kind of, you know, and if you enjoy that sensation, then prescription stimulants are also going to provide a bit more sustained of that feeling. Yeah. Um, so, and it, you know, it could be that it's replacing it a bit, um, but generally what I found, because we were wondering when marijuana first became legalized if that was going to replace alcohol, we have seen a reduction, um, but it's not like it replaced one or the other. Um, it's more like it tempered it a bit. So right now it seems like vaping is just the more popular one. Yeah. So. And it is really interesting to see marijuana go down as it's become legal, particularly yeah. edibles. I was really surprised. Yeah, me too. The number of kids that are yeah. using pot through edibles is actually down and yeah. pretty minimal. Yeah. Which would be synonymous with some of the ideas of, yeah. uh, of access and usability. I know. Ease of, of use. I'd like to think it was our safe storage campaign yeah. around, like lock up your edibles, <laughs> but it was probably something bigger than that. Um, so one last question. Do you have the data that compares us with other um, kids in the state or region? Are we, are we, we have comparable it, or doing like, are there any highlights in terms of what we're doing that might yeah, be something only, we can continue to support? So like on the little addendum that I have, um, oh. there aren't huge differences between Hampshire County and Northampton High. Um, some of the differences that I did see, they're not significant, but they're just ones that maybe we would like to be better at. And one was like school rewards for pro-social involvement. Hampshire County tends to do a bit better than we do. And we're only talking four percentage points, but I don't know. It'd be nice to see that higher. Um, the other is that, um, so a positive one is that where Northampton does seem to shine is that we have 63% of our 8th, 10th, and 12th graders report that their grades are mostly A's. And when you look at Hampshire County, only 47% of students report a similar feeling about their grades. So, so academically, we definitely shine. Um, there were some concerns. 8th um, grade this year was kind of low with I feel safe at school. They're around 76% versus 8th grade for Hampshire County was 81%. So we're trying to figure out why that would be. Mm -hmm. um, and. Let's see. I'm trying to think what the other. Hampshire County is a little bit better at um, when the question was asked, the school lets my parents know when I've done something well. 20% um, versus 26%. So a lot of it has to do with like the protective factors around schools are feeling connected to your school, feeling like um, you're getting recognized for your good work and that you're encouraged to be pro socially involved. So we're not that different from the county, but there were a couple areas that I just mentioned where we're a little bit low. Right. So it'd be better to see that go up. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Yep. That's awesome. Um, oh. So thank, yeah, thank you. Um, a lot of really interesting information, and I shared some of the questions that were already asked. But just to ask a little deeper on one, um, I agree. I'm really concerned with this idea of vaping for you know social peer pressure versus the addiction and how we tend to address that. And I'm wondering, a lot of the data you showed us were, have you tried this once or have you tried it in the last 30 days? And the vaping maybe is a little bit more complicated, but how long does it, because I don't think we, I don't think it's separated like that. It just looks like we know roughly 30% of our 10th to 12th graders are probably vaping pretty regularly. regularly. Yep. And I guess Almost my, all the data I did was past 30 day use. I just showed one lifetime. One. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I'm just wondering, do we know how long it takes to get addicted? How addictive is vaping? Um, well, maybe we vaping don't know. is nicotine, and so it is a little bit dependent on the person. Um, some people get hooked the first time they try it, um, but generally, I would say in general, like a few weeks of use. And the concern with vaping too, especially if they're using jewels, is that there's this. I wish I could have shared with you. There's this new presentation put up by this big organization that I that I work under, and. Um, the tobacco industry has tried various ways throughout the century to find make nicotine more addictive and some of its flavors, some of its other things. And Juul uses something called a nicotine salt, which is um, very, one, it's a very potent nicotine and it absorbs more easily into your system than the type of nicotine you get from a cigarette. So there's a bunch of concerns around Juul in particular, vaping in general, that it's just more in addictive in general than a cigarette. And it's also harder to moderate because with a cigarette, like, 
there's a beginning and an end point. You light it, you smoke it, you throw it away. You have to go grab another one if you want one. With the vape, there's a pack worth of cigarettes in a vape. And so if you're hitting that all day long, you're getting a, a pack's worth of nicotine in maybe an afternoon if you're just using it without being conscious of it. So, so I just encourage us collectively yeah. <laughs> to try to figure out how to, um, you know, one thing you said is maybe friends who see their friends are getting addicted to offer help and that isn't maybe being received as well, but to continue encouraging that and brainstorming other ideas because I think punishing kids when they're truly addictive is a really tough yeah. um, place to be. And my other question is if we know roughly, you, we probably don't know the answer to this, but if we know roughly 30% of the kids are vaping regularly, how many of those are actually, you know, getting caught. And when I say getting caught, I'm not trying to catch them to punish them. It's more trying to it's send really, a message to the parents and get I don't, help for them. I don't have the data, but yeah. I mean, from my conversations with the high school in general, um, it's not the 30% because it's yeah. so elusive. Yeah. These devices are tiny. Exactly. They're putting off just a little bit of exhalant. Mm -hmm. And by the time, like even if you, like schools even that have installed vape detectors, by the time they get the notice and run down there, mm -hmm. it's gone. And yeah. nobody's going to like say, oh, it was him. Like they're just yeah. sort of like, oh, it was of mine, it's my perfume, it's, I have gum. Um, and so it's really, really hard to identify them. So it's like, um, I mean, my favorite analogy, it's not very professional, is whack-a-mole. Like it's just, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. really infuriating and frustrating and um, that's why I feel like we really need parental help and like first off, like they need, the devices need to stay out of the schools. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, it's a huge drain on the administrators, it's a huge health risk for the students and feeling, I, I mean, I, this is what I do for a living, but this kind of like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, like energy around it, not not from here, but I mean, just I think sometimes um, parents or all of us as a nation just feel overwhelmed by it, and it's just sort of like maybe we just need to look at small concrete steps and just build from there. Um, and certainly, yeah, it doesn't have to be punitive, but it does need, I think, I th said this already, like the schools need to be empowered to keep these out of their buildings and then identify the students that need help and make sure they get help. So, Thanks. yeah. Hi, yes, Ms. Busansky, Ms. Ms. Fallon was before oh, me. Go so ahead. Um, no, can you just update us on the, I saw that the Board of Health was having a public hearing last week. I oh, yeah, and I was wishing Melinda would come here. Are you here? Oh, you're Oh, I didn't even see you. So, um, so the Board of Health had with they had held off on their final vote just because the state wasn't clear on what they were going to do, uh -huh. and the state has now followed up with everything Northampton was going to do. So, for the entire state, do you want to speak to this? Because you can. Yeah. Do you want to speak to this? Because you're going to do it more accurately than I will summarize. Hey, come on. Up. I won't take your time. I'll go quickly. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> I'm Melinda Kaliana, so I'm the Program Coordinator for Hampshire Franklin Tobacco Free Community Partnership out of the Collaborative for Educational Services. And there's been, a, you know, a, an ex, a, for lack of a better word, an explosion of work around vaping in uh, policy land um, outside of outside of our, you know, school department and all up up a ways. So, you know, there was the ban, the ban from the governor that got a lot of publicity and really got the legislature moving. Uh, so the legislature passed a bill which was then signed by the governor, which does a lot of things that will hopefully, you know, support youth uh, cessation and youth choosing not to vape and making, you know, a, a policy changes that'll, that'll have long-term change. Specifically, um, all flavored, t so the, the, what, the, what the bill does has, what the, what the law did established was then further uh, specified by the Public Health Council this week. So now we know what the state law is going to do. What the state law does is it's not an outright ban of flavored tobacco, which also will include menthol, mint, and wintergreen, which we know are the most popular and probably the most poisonous flavoring for a number of reasons, but it restricts the use of those flavored products to smoking bars. And smoking bars are a very specific and um, Department of Revenue regulated uh, institutions and they're not easy to run. So, for example, in Northampton, I don't think we have any smoking bars. There's only six in the entire Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. So all flavors are restricted to be sold for use on the premises of these smoking bars. And other than that, they're not allowed to be sold mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. Um, the one exception to that is menthol, mint, and wintergreen, which is allowed to be sold in Massachusetts until June of next year. So 
that's, that's a big part of this law that happened very, very quickly. The second thing that's really important is it's raising the price of vape products that are allowed to be, remain, to be sold, which remain, the remaining flavors are tobacco and unflavored vape juice. In particular, those two items, if they are over a 35 milligram volume of nicotine, can only be sold in 21 and, only, 21 and older tobacco retail establishments. That's the 5% Juul Pod. That's the most popular Juul Pod that's, that's been sold. Juul does, new, and it includes other high, uh, high nicotine products. If it's under 35 milligrams, those can be continued to be sold in convenience stores, but can, in other stores that, that sell tobacco that aren't 21 only. Um, but, so that'll be what's often referred to as the 3% Juul Pod and other tobacco products that are vape products that are under 35 milligrams, but those will have to be provided. The amount of nicotine in those products have to be proven to be under 35 milligrams by the distributor and the manufacturer. So that's interesting because that we haven't had any information about what's in other vape products. So that's amazing. But also new is that all cessation um, uh, uh, nicotine replacement therapies under the new law will be essentially free. All copays will not need, now need to be taken care of. So there won't be copays. So that lowers the barrier for people who want to quit. It will now all be covered by their health insurer. So that's amazing. The last thing is the price is going to go up. And we know that when price goes up, use goes down. So all vape products will now have a 75% tax on their wholesale value, which puts them in line with with, with traditional cigarettes. So pretty much every avenue from which we have tried to combat tobacco tactics in the past has been rolled into this one bill, in this one new state law, and new regulations about vaping. So lots of policy has been done to support trying to stop this epidemic. On the local level, the, board of, the Northampton Board of Health did hold a hearing about restricting flavors, which did, you know, was sort of a subset of the state law. But Northampton is also considering going beyond that and taking all tobacco products, so all cigarettes, all unflavored regular old tobacco cigarettes, and placing them in 21 plus only stores. And so that's one of the things that they're still considering and haven't voted on as well, capping the number of retailers they're going to allow in the city to sell tobacco products. So those two things are still sort of in, in the hopper. Last but not least, um, you know, there's been a lot of stuff otherwise going on in tobacco land, and I won't take up too much of your time, but just to give you some ideas, um, uh, Am uh, um, CES, the, the Amherst School Department, or Amherst School Superintendent has contracted with CES to try to come up with a comprehensive approach to deal with the vaping epidemic, so that's kind of going on, and they're using some of Northampton's uh, ideas such as the e-check uh, e e up and go. Um, as well, Joe Comerford is on a, is a co-chair of a committee that's looking at the vaping industry. That's amazing. Um, so she's just been in contact with us as well. Uh, and last but not least, we're, through my organization, through Ananda, we, we try to do a lot with the schools. And one of the things we're going to present that just came out this week is a letter that's going to go out, hopefully the schools will choose to send out to the parents which in a very gentle and approachable way talks about ways like how, how you might want to talk with your, your children about vaping and including in that uh, new vaping uh, cessation or helping, helping resources for kids who, who do want to quit or moving along that line of change um, that are text-based or counseling-based, suggesting they go see their pediatrician and last but not least as well, uh, information and text-based products for the parents to support their children who want to quit vaping, or even just for parents who want to find out about how to help their children start thinking about quitting vaping. So hopefully that will go out as well. So we're, we're trying from all sorts of different angles. Policy is the most longstanding change, makes the longest uh, established change, but that of course takes a little while. But we're trying these other resources to try to help move people who are addicted now. Thank so, you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, Ms. Busansky. Thank you. That's great. I mean, that is just such great news about the law, and yeah, it's very great. So, um, so just a quick, uh, I guess, a comment and a question. So, it just I was interested, in, Ananda, in your chart on use rates and perception of harm, and how what's happened with vaping, and how it sort of has busted wide open with the law and the ban and the unfortunate deaths, and that I I think it's hard to believe that. Um, 
that anyone would really not believe that vaping is dangerous, where I can say a year ago I was having conversations with parents who really did not understand that vaping was dangerous for their kids. So um, it'll be interesting to see in the next survey how that kind of, uh, how those two numbers work together. And then I'm just curious, how do we share this information with our schools? Like the results of the survey to the, like how with the high school and the middle school, do they get results of this survey? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Principals, yeah, so just the, curious how that works. Sure. So um, SPIFI, I always get the acronym wrong, so I'm not going to try. Strategic Planning for Families, <laughs> da, da, da. Um, they, um, they hired the consultant to help us with the survey, and then I'm the conduit who gets it to Northampton High School and JFK. When the results get released, they go to John first, and then they go to school committee. Mm -hmm. So you were the first audience, and then once you're all informed on this, then it goes to, then we do faculty presentations at all the schools, by invitation usually, like if we're not invited, then I just share it with the principals, and you know, if they have questions, they can reach out to me. But usually they have me come in and we do a brief presentation on like what the rates are and how they can be supportive. And then we also do a slightly altered version for parents, like we don't have to get into so much stuff, but just sort of like, we get into the questions, I think was <coughs> Laura was asking, like what about family connection is and how's that? So we, mm -hmm. we focus on more of the parental, you know, factors that could be helpful. And then student groups, if they ever want the data, we seek permission from John first, and if we get the okay to share it, then we share it that way, and they use it in their statistical classes and stuff like that. So that's generally how we use it, and then obviously we compile it for trend data. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mr. Kaufman. Very quick, last question. Uh, I maybe. Um, <laughs> in terms of vape use, do you see any differences by student gender and student ethnicity? No. No. Um, but before I say no to ethnicity, um, I didn't look at that very closely before I came into this because our we skew. Um, so many of our students are white. Um, like in our class. Um, but I did look at gender because almost every single one is broken down by gender and um, the male-female use rates are almost identical. Wow, okay, yep. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much you. for the presentation and for the work. Um, so, um, did have a quick uh, request um, from the vice chair. Um, we have a, um, Longtime member of the school committee who came tonight hoping to speak in public comment. And they were a little late in arriving. And um, I believe the vice chair was going to ask if we could just briefly suspend rules uh, to allow a former member to speak. Um, right. So I would ask to suspend the rules in order to have Lisa Minnick recognize the podium. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any discussion on that? Okay. So um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so, Ms. Minnick. My apologies for not realizing that you were starting early this evening. You know I'm always late to everything anyway, but <laughs> I, I would have tried harder if I had known. Thank you very much for indulging me. Pretend this is still open session. My name is Lisa Minnick. I live at the top of the hill next door at 20 Bridge Road, Unit 21 in Florence, Massachusetts. Tonight marks the final meeting for several current school, commi school committee members. Some Northampton residents haven't given much thought to the role of a school committee representative in guiding our school district. Others watch the monthly meetings on cable TV but don't realize the commitment beyond these meetings. As a former school committee member, I am aware of the time spent reading, learning, attending subcommittee meetings, sitting on community committees or municipal boards, reviewing budgets, conducting negotiations, and speaking with community members. I know about the missed dinners and sports events and the long telephone calls, but despite the cost, serving as a school committee representative is personally rewarding and a generous, very generous gift to the city. The members that are retiring this evening collectively exemplify extraordinary intelligence a wealth of skills, deep understanding of the social and educational needs of students, sincere respect for the values and diversity of our community, and the utmost moral conscience. They also coincidentally are an exceptionally physical fit, physically fit group, and I just will say, bicycle snow tires. <laughs> I'm honored to have called them colleagues and friends, 
to Molly Burnham, Howard Moore, Ann Hennessy, Downey Meyer, and Vice Chair Ed Zahowski, I extend my heartfelt thanks for your time and wisdom and dedication and my very best wishes for great enjoyment of your newfound free time. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for coming. Okay. We'll Mr. Chair, I note that I think if you add all of our service up, we just barely. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, <laughs> service. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now we'll return to regular order, and um, we next have a, uh, a vote to or an annual uh, vote to accept the NEF Small Grant Awards. And is someone from NEF here this evening? Great. We had Dale on the agenda, but if you could just identify yourself. <laughs> sure. So, as you've probably figured out, I am not Dale. Um, my name is Mona Culp. I do know some of you, but not all. So, I'll, I'll just take a quick minute to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a new member on the board of NEF and also a member of its small grants committee. I'm also a Florence resident and have a daughter in sixth grade at JFK as well as a daughter in ninth grade at, uh, North, in Northampton High. Um, I'd like to also start by acknowledging and saying thank you to Howard Moore, who has been the school committee representative on the NEF board, as well as Laura Fallon, who just looks like she stepped out as a previous rep. So I want to acknowledge their service. Um, Additionally, we have two Northampton High students who are members of the Small Grants Committee. Uh, today I'm Martin Gonzalez and Rachel Parent, and I want to acknowledge the work that they have done, and they have our thanks. In this grant cycle, we had 23 applicants and a request for over $70,000. NEF tries our best to fund as many promising grants as possible. And I'd like to take a mo moment to just remind you that when you get your census mailing, you might see a little envelope for NEF. And almost every dollar given to NEF outside of the endowment funds goes to funding these small grants that I'm going to be mentioning today. So if you're able to give, it is appreciated. I will go through and read the diversity of the grants that we have funded in this cycle, as well as um, the schools that they will be serving. So Bridge Street School has a second year grant for the Wonders of Water project for $3,000, uh, led by Nicole Bunnell. I will also just say that if I am saying a name incorrectly, that is inadvertent, so please excuse me. Uh, a brief description of the project. Uh, classroom sessions um, will be funded on um, water, uh, the topic of water and aquatic ecology, and as well as two field trips to um, Arcadia. And this is for the second graders at Bridge Street. Also at Bridge Street School, establishing and embedding core values was funded for $1,000, uh, led by Jennifer Duringer. And this project supports school-wide community building and the social and emotional curriculum with workshops at the school, as well as a design of a new Bridge Street School logo. At Jackson Street School, we are funding the Special Needs Resource Room Enrichment Project for $1,000. And this is led by Kathy Bredden. And this project will enhance the upstairs resource room to make it an inviting and stigma-free environment that can better accommodate the learning experience of upper elementary school, school students, particularly those who have special needs in the areas of sensory processing, ADD, and socio-emotional and behavior regulation challenges. At Leeds, the Sensory Pathways for School Hallways for $1,000 by Joanne Intreter. By adhering pre-made sticker pathways to the hallway floors in the kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, and fourth grade um, wings, the project will create four spaces where the students will have the opportunity to hop, step, and jump, jump their way to a brain break when needed. The Meadowbrook Project uh, at Leeds Holly Taylor is the lead for $2,200. Once a month, speakers from the community will come to Meadowbrook Community Room to talk to caregivers, caregivers on issues such as ADHD, parenting tips, social media, and community agencies, and provide resources and support for the parents and caregivers of the students. In addition to working with the caregivers there, the teachers will also provide the students with integrated literacy activities. 
The After School Partnership at Ryan Road for $3,000, led by Rachel Dworkin. Ryan Road teachers will also will be working with the Northampton Housing Authority uh, Resident Services Coordinator, Natanya Ortiz, to offer a, a twice a week teacher hour after school at Florence Heights. The 1770s Northampton Living History Project, uh, and this is for all of the elementary schools, third grades, and that's for $2,969, led by, Chim, uh, by Kim Gerald. And in this third grade history exploration, students will take on a real person who lived in Northampton during the 1770s, and through their character's perspective, they will learn about the history of the era. At JFK Middle School, a virtual reality project for $2,000 and $2,400, led by Will Banks. Um, this grant funds virtual reality headsets in a new and innovative approach to teaching and learning that is meant to dramatically increase student engagement and learning. And this is for all sixth grade social studies students. At Northampton High School, Trout in the Classroom for $425, led by Jamie Anderson. And this is working with the Massachusetts Division of Fish and Wildlife. This project will raise awareness about the conservation of resources and support for native species such as brook trout. A coffee cart at Northampton High School for $2,000 led by Kate Bird. This grant funds the creation of a small co coffee cart business run by the high school's special ed students for teachers and staff. The students will learn and execute all the necessary skills needed to independently operate the coffee cart business at Northampton High. Also at Northampton High, adaptive music program for gold students for $1,500, by, uh, led by Marianne Lockwood. This grant funds an adaptive music program for the gold students to be taught by the Community Music School of Springfield's Adaptive Music Partnership. <coughs> A joint um, JFK Northampton High School project Creating the Good, Translating the History of Genocide into Civic Engagement for $450, led by Kate Todd Hunter. Building upon the previously NEF funded, Looking for the Good in Rwanda, any NHS and JFK students will continue to expand their content knowledge and ultimately apply their learning to create and ex execute joint community projects as well as build civic engagement and ongoing relationships with local and global organizations. So I went through them rather rapidly, but hopefully you get a sense that we are looking to fund creative uh, learning opportunities at all of the different Northampton public schools. And NEF is happy to support the teachers and their goals. Um, I would like to conclude by asking the school committee to accept these gifts on behalf of the NEF. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, would the liaison like to make a uh, motion? I'll move that we accept this gift uh, gratefully and with real recognition not only to NEF but to all the people who contributed to NEF. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any uh, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. It passes. And again, thank you to NEF <laughs> and to all those who support NEF. Okay. Uh, next, we move into. Um, a vote on a donation. This is uh, Jackson Street PTO uh, providing uh, a donation of funds for Nature's Classroom Bus Transportation in the amount of $1,380. Um, Ms. Lemica, do you have anything that seems fairly self-explanatory? Um, it does. I just wanted to let you know that this was uh, for a trip in October and the paperwork had not just come forward to the school committee, so I just wanted to catch that. Okay. Motion to uh, accept the donation from Jackson Street PTO for Nature's Classroom Bus Transportation in the amount of $1,380. Is there a second? Okay. There's a second. Any discussion about that? Hopefully not, because the trip already happened. And <laughs> so um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Excellent. Thank you to Jackson Street PTO. Um, and now we'll move to E, which is a discussion of something we discussed with the student union earlier, and that's the uh, late start and just an update from uh, Superintendent Provost. Thank you. So this is the second late start plan that I've been working on since during my time as superintendent in Northampton. I think we've gotten farther with this one than the last. Um, just to 
take people through the chronology. This work really started early last spring um, when there was renewed interest on the committee in uh, trying to achieve a later start time for the high school. For all the reasons that have been discussed over the course of the past two decades. Um, at that time, we did a survey of um, elementary parents around what I think is probably one of the simpler plans that's been proposed and which is the one that I think may have um, the best chance at this time, which is just moving everything back half an hour. Um, it resolves the issues that was brought up earlier in one of the plans where flipping the tiers was proposed that older students wouldn't be there um, to take care of younger students. It also um, is cost neutral because my other plan that I brought forward was rejected because of the cost involved with it. Um, so this doesn't add a, a penny to the, cent, to the um, cost of student transportation. It just would move everything back half an hour. We started last spring by surveying the elementary school parents because we figured that the elementary um, students and their parents would be the most impacted by that um, change because they would be starting quite late, um, I think, by most standards. But we found that, um, to my surprise, that parents responded favorably to the proposal by a, a ratio of about two to one. Um, so you sent me <coughs> the mission this fall to go to the open houses and try to talk to the parents in the one-third group and try to find out more about reasons why elementary parents might, might not have been in favor. And that mission um, was undertaken, but not, as I said, not um, entirely successful when I presented the results because at the open houses, I found that the parents were even more favorable than they were in the survey when they actually had an opportunity to um, discuss it. Um, so that was a much smaller group. It was the people that I were able to have individual conversations with while I was tabling at the open houses. But at that time, um, the parents of elementary students were in favor by about four to one. Um, so uh, the next part of this process is we felt that we should get some information from the high school students who this effort is all being done um, on behalf of. And so um, before many of you were in the room tonight, high school students presented the results of their survey. So that's uh, mainly what I would like to talk about tonight. They did a, a very uh, comprehensive survey with a large sample size. They were able to capture about 76% of all high school students in their responses. Um, and found that overall the high school students supported a uh, later start at the high school, the plan of a half an hour delay, by uh, about 60 to 40%. Um, among those who were in the 40%, the most prevalent concern was um, con concerns about athletics. Um, there was also a, a group, this is probably the, the next largest distinct group, which was um, concerns about work schedules. There was one slice of the pie that was slightly larger than work schedules, but that was the other group, so that was a bunch of different um, reasons thrown in together. So then there was a um, attempt by the high school students to take a, a look more closely at the work concerns, and they found that about three quarters of the students felt that they probably would be able to adjust their work schedules in order to um, accommodate a later start time, which would mean a later end time. But about a quarter thought that it, that, might, that might represent um, a real problem for them in their job. So um, that is about, in terms of actual students, about 34 students in the high school who might uh, end up losing a job if we implement a later start time at the high school. They also um, surveyed students on the amount of sleep they were getting um, and presented us with a basically bell-shaped curve that says the most of the students at the high school are getting between six and a half and eight hours of sleep currently. Um, and then there are some who are getting less and some who are getting more. Uh, they also uh, asked students to identify by race so that they could disaggregate the data to see if a later start time had differential support based on racial subgroup or had it 
potential disparate impact. And they found that uh, the support for the later start time was slightly stronger among white students than among students um, who are in the global majority. Um, not a big difference, but a, a, a detectable difference um, with the plan being more popular among white students. Um, and then they looked at also the uh, impact on students who thought they would potentially have trouble with um, their jobs and found that it didn't really seem to have a differential impact based on race. There were students in um, both the white subgroup and the students of the global majority who would potentially have issues with uh, maintaining their jobs at about the same rate. Um, and I say, again, that's about a quarter of the students who currently have work think that a later start uh, might, might be a problem. So um, they, uh, they presented that data earlier tonight as part of their um, presentation. The, the one thing that I would add is they also presented on results of their overall survey on issues that high school students would like to see addressed at the high school. Start time is their number three issue. Um, most important issue is racial inequities. The second is environmental sustainability. And start time is uh, number three concern for high school students. So um, this is potentially a way of addressing a high priority need for students in a way that would be acceptable to the majority of them. Now I also said um, last time we spoke about this that in addition to hearing what students think about this issue before making a determination, it would be important to hear what the staff have to say. Um, as you know, I meet with the union on a monthly basis and um, in preparation for this month's school committee meeting, let them know that student data was coming forward and asked about when staff data would be available. And my understanding is that NACE will be distributing a survey to their uh, membership, which will be available for the committee to review in January. I know there is a, um, I know there's a desire to try to make a decision as soon as possible because it has an impact on scheduling. Um, but I think that the January data will be a very important piece. Um, the only other thing that I just throw out there is I, I have this, I have this nagging concern, having done a lot of things, um, that even after having ex explicitly gone out in two ways to try to get um, parent feedback, that there may be parents out there who this just doesn't isn't on their radar screen or, or don't have the bandwidth for. So. Um, at the time that the committee is ready to actually move forward, there may need to be some other effort to try to really make parents aware that the committee is ready to make a decision so they have an opportunity to have one last chance to weigh in. Just my feeling, um, that's what I have. Thank you. Is there any um, questions or discussions by the uh, school committee? Mr. Meyer, you look heartbroken that you won't I, be here uh, for uh, well, start discussion. Well, it is actually one of the things that's um, been most frustrating is that we were $80,000 away from making the start time change after the override in 2013. And that, you know, $80,000 was the difference between making this change, which is recommended by such bomb throwers as the American Academy of Pediatrics and those other crazy folks at the CDC. I mean, just doing a quick Google, Dover, Sherburne is at 835, Weston is at 845, Lincoln Sudbury is at 750, Belmont's at 8, Longmeadow is at 744. Um, you know, I remember Jim Miller saying that he would be fine with moving the start time to 815 and it would make no change um, in athletics. Uh, I guess the thing that seems a little strange to me after hearing the, you know, the information on vaping is that I don't think that we do surveys of the either the staff or the students or the parents about what we should do in relation to vaping. We don't say, hmm, uh, if, you know, will this inconvenience you? Um, will this make it harder for you to focus in class? We just accept it as a health risk with long-term impacts. And if you look at the list of things 
that you're at higher risk for if you're sleep deprived as a teenager, you know, they're, they're the similar serious things. And so either we take seriously that information from people who study sleep and study the health of adolescents. I was talking to you know, Lonnie and, and he said, well, the CDC, if they could come. And I said, well, Jonathan Schwab has been here, you know, my kid's pediatrician has been here at that podium years ago now, you know, imploring us to make the change. We've had people who are, you know, work with adolescents, you know, who are psychologists working with adolescents and, and trying to help them with sleep. And the last time, you know, we had a substantive discussion, there was some, you know, members who were like, well, sleep hygiene will fix it. And again, if you look at the CDC, they say sleep hygiene and a start time no earlier than 8.30. So I won't be here. Um, there are benefits, you know, but again, I hope, I hope that if it is in fact cost neutral that the district, if it can, it will go forward with it. And again, as far as people not having the bandwidth, I've sat on enough committees in this city to know that you can literally deliver a postcard to people informing them of a change that's going to happen and have six months of public hearings and they will show up on the last day and say how dare you move forward without asking me. And I, I just can't, I can't think that that would be a reason not to go forward with a change that has been too long in happening. Any other comments or questions, discussion? Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you uh, for that update, uh, Dr. Provost, and we'll wait for that additional information in January. Next, we'll move into uh, discussion and vote on uh, goals for the superintendent, and this comes from the um, Superintendent Evaluation Committee, and I'll turn to Mr. Zahowski. I believe everyone in their packets received um, the goals for the superintendent we met uh, last month as a subcommittee and went through the goals with Dr. Provost and it was the recommendation of the committee to um, to accept those goals um, but it comes to the full committee for a vote um, so if you had a chance to take a look at the goals if you have any questions for Dr. Provost at this time it would be the time to, to ask any questions that you might have before we vote Uh, so I, I have I have some questions, and I guess I have comments because I feel like this is a really important um, set of goals. We're going to be evaluating them over the course, I guess, probably in July if it follows the same calendar as it did last year, and I want to get them right. So I hope you'll bear with me, but I, I do have a lot of comments. Um, I'll start with the first one, and I don't want to. Um, dominate so I'll just start with the first one and maybe other people will have some comments but these are s called SMART goals specific and strategic measurable action oriented <coughs> rigorous realistic and results focused and timed and tracked and I just think there's some suggestions that I have that can make them more consistent with that acronym um, the first goal I agree with the goal, but I'm worried that I don't know how it's going to get measured, and I think we could improve it as a committee with some input. So it says, throughout this two-year cycle, I will prioritize improving supports and service to Hispanic and Latino students so that they can meet the annual achievement targets identified through the Massachusetts Accountability System. So there's a second paragraph, but with that, I, I I think it's referring to MCAS, I'm not totally sure. And I don't know what is, they can meet, some of them meet, wh how many of them meet. Um, I just think we could be more specific so we can measure it and, and that's what this is asking. And then the second part of the way this is written says, given the size of the current achievement gap, this goal is expected to require attention for many years. Even if we are able to meet the annual achievement targets, it would take more than a decade to flow, fully close this achievement gap. And this is where I feel we can do a lot better. I agree. I think putting it in perspective that this is a long-term goal to close this achievement gap, to get 
this subgroup that has consistently been performing below where we want them to, below all the other subgroups, get them up. But so I agree with acknowledging this is a long-term goal, but then I'd really like to see us, you, add some specific goals that could be measured that could happen this year. And I don't, you know, it's not probably my place to dictate exactly what those goals are, but some potential examples would be um, to say, why is this subgroup performing below? Why? Because we talk about it all the time that this subgroup performs below all the other subgroups, but how do we figure out why? And for me, if we could get some reasons into why by July, that would be like a great measurable step. Um, so long term, let's fix it, but short term, let's better understand why the gap exists. Um, the first step to articulate reasons and causes of this lower performance and then suggest mechanisms to address it. And that ties into our retreat two nights ago. If we know why and we can suggest mechanisms to address it, it can tie to the following year's budget and we have a more specific way of getting at it. And, um, you know, as I thought about this when I read these goals, because I, I think we all, we've talked about these things a lot, um, some of the thoughts I came up with were um, looking at in elementary schools when the kids first enter the system are we in our special ed education in SPED are we don't, maybe don't know this are white and middle class kids getting different resources than kids of color and poor kids and is that part of the story um, is there implicit bias along the way um, or stereotype threat. And what I mean by that is we've been talking about this for so long are some of us expecting there to be a gap and we're not treating it properly. So starting to ask these questions and, and, and the final thing is can we talk to, um, I don't know, the, I don't know if you can do this, the families, the, peop, the teachers who are teaching them about why is this happening. And for me, six months from now understanding better what's causing this gap and being able to hear what people think can, can fix it is a better place to be and it's more specific and it meets these SMART acronym. So if you want me to respond to that, I'd say that um, I do, I will argue that I believe the goal is very measurable because it's tied to the Massachusetts accountability system which specifies exact targets um, to, be, to be met in terms of student achievement. In terms of, um, adding to sort of a, a deeper understanding of reasons why, that, that is a, a piece of feedback that I, I think I can accept. Um, the, the reasons are multifaceted um, and bias does have a lot to do with it. Um, the implicit bias work that we do as a district um, and we have done as part of this district improvement plan is based on the premise that we only get so far by complaining about the bias of our culture, our society, whatever, what we should do and what we can have a much more leverage on is um, looking at our own contribution to it. Um, and so I think that we have identified some places where um, there, there are biases at work in our system and we're um, trying to address that in a number of ways. And so I'd be happy to talk about that or to, to add that or to have something about that when um, we come together to talk about this next. In terms of um, special education, I don't think that's an issue. Um, the Budget and Property Subcommittee got together earlier today, as, um, as you know, and one of the things that I had prepared, although we didn't have a chance to take a look at um, significantly, were the identification rates across the elementary schools. and. As you know, because we did have the disproportionality um, examination from the department and found that we were basically right on. Um, we do have two potential places where we might have a little bit of work to do. One is Jackson Street School over identifying students who are Hispanic and Latino. And the other area where we see a potential disproportionality is Bridge Street under identifying white students potentially. But every other um, school was right where you would predict they would be in terms of identifying and providing supports to kids. Um, but there are, there are many issues that address this and um, one of the one of the um, 
other goals that's um, presented talk is actually the professional practice goal um, working with the Center for Urban Education um, to learn more about the equity minded tools that goal is specifically about trying to unpack and um, become more conscious more conscious of some of the things that our system does to not produce better equity for students so um, I think what you're asking for is actually embedded in the professional practice school with respect to that and I'm, I'm happy to have that here or, or just know that this professional practice goal will lead to some of what you're um, requesting in terms of the causation around this goal. Um, so I agree the third, that third one, I agree it ties in really nicely with this. I guess I still don't, um, I look at this and I feel like it's very high level and to have something that's measurable and doable, um, it does feel to me that having the big picture goal but then something that's a shorter term, measurable, smaller goal. You, I think it even says we're not going to reach the targets, and I appreciate that. So there's a published target for different subgroups, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, for it, it says, you know, over many years. So how are we going to get there without fully understanding the problem, and where are we going to be in July when we need to evaluate this? And just one more thing, I've I've heard a lot of talking to a lot of people this fall, and what I meant in terms of the special ed is a little bit different than what we talked about earlier today in the property and sub um, budget budget and property subcommittee meeting. Once children are identified in special ed, are they treated the same way independent of their race or their economic background? So mm -hmm. do some kids have families perhaps that are in a position to advocate better for them and get different treatment and how does that play out over that process and could that be a reason why in the subgroup of disabilities kids in special ed do we see a, a difference in Hispanic <coughs> Latino students and other students and I don't know the answer to that but I think so, we should look into it so I can I can speak to that um, as a former special education director I would say there's no question that there's different um, there's different access to special education. I used to say that the state says it has a special education problem resolution system, but it really only has a problem resolution system for upper middle class and rich people. Um, so there's no doubt that there, there's a difference there. The, um, but it would be very wrong to assume that that can be an, um, a factor that explains most of the gap because most of the students who are Hispanic and Latino are not students with disabilities. Like, as I said earlier, their identification is tracking right on to their, um, their, pro their proportion of the enrollment. So 75% more or less of them are being educated in general education. So we should be looking at what it is about our practices in general education that may be biased or inappropriate or ineffective for Hispanic and Latino students more so than what's happening in special ed. You know, I was just going to add, I, I, this is, um, there's a couple of things that really aren't directly part of this evaluation, but in terms of your question about the gap, there's a couple of our practices that we, we know about that um, so that affect the achievement gaps. So for example, the research on a late start shows that the impact on academic performance is roughly twice that for people on the bottom part of the achievement gap as on the top half of the achievement gap. In other words, people on the top half get an improvement from a later start, and people on the bottom half get a double that improvement. So our, our start time is one thing that's impacting the achievement gap. Um, another big thing has to do with the, you know, the racial makeup of, of our teaching staff. And, and our teachers are well more than 90% white. Um, our student body is only around, well, in some of our elementary schools, our student body is, is around 60% white. Um, in overall, the whole, you know, system it's about 70 percent so 
so, so that's another thing that we know we're doing, which is contributing to the achievement gap, because we also, there's other research which shows that having, you know, teachers that, have, that you can, you know, that are of your racial group has a positive impact on your um, performance. So, so those are two things that are on the gap which really wouldn't lend themselves to this particular format of things the superintendent could do. Although certainly I think the superintendent is aware that he wants to increase the numbers of the racial diversity of our teaching staff, and um, he's working on the start time. Thing. I think, thank you. So that's the kind of thing that I think should be in the goal because it says, I'll prioritize improving supports and service to Hispanic and Latino students so they can meet the annual achievement targets, but there's nothing in here talking about how. And so what I was suggesting is maybe there needs to be time to identify those things and having a goal of identifying the most important things would seem reasonable, but if we already know what they are, then they should be listed here because I don't, I don't see how this is very measurable on the order of a year or two. The changes might get made, but how do we measure it? Oh, well, well, probably in a year or two, don't you think? That's a big thing to move. Yeah, I, I would say just from being on the committee for the last couple of years, we do meet three times with the superintendent throughout the year, and we do check in. And at those times, um, I mean, it, it is organic, so to speak, as he gets into what his goal is, identifies the stakeholders and, and the pieces he shares with us what the process is and where he is at and changes that he might be making along the way or areas that he's really accelerating in so that when we come together at the end of the year he can he can share with us all the documentation which in many cases is hundreds of pages worth of documentation on the work that he's done so that we can then we can score him. Thank you. Yeah, so also as a member of the superintendent's subcommittee, th there's, no, there's no way in the world that this reflects everything that our superintendent does. This is a piece of it. Um, that said, um, I think we have, and I know I have been asking Dr. Provost to pay more attention to the SMART goals. So for example, the, uh, the previous iteration of this didn't have um, the aspect of when these goals would be completed, and there was one of the goals that was new, and I appreciate you adding these dimensions to it. Um, that said, this is the first time that we've been able to discuss openly some of the changes, so I just had a couple of comments about that. But I, but I do think it's important to recognize that there's, um, there's an there's a added importance that the superintendent demonstrates this evaluation system, uh, because I believe it's the one public one. And it's the one that is a model, if you will, and we can't ask all the other educators to um, follow a model unless it meets what I think is sometimes a really overly restrictive SMART goals format. So I, I guess I kind of look for the spirit of SMART goals, but adding things like what will be accomplished by the end of the year I think are very important because we ask everybody to do that. So with that said, for example, the, the goal, and this one act, it has just changed slightly, but the third one that begins with in order to identify new opportunities and it's your engagement with the Center for Urban Education. Uh, I think that's great, and I really would look forward to you learning something. I wonder within here, can you either put in or um, let us know that you plan to share these new opportunities that you've learned as part of this goal with us? Like you, you're, you're identifying new, you're saying that you want to identify new opportunities. Do you envision that being up a list of things that would then become something that we collectively share and support through our budget? Or I think those would be the artifacts that I'm sharing with the team at the end of the year when they say, so when you say to me, so what did you, what did you do with the Center for Urban Education? What, what tools did you learn? So that How did you apply that? that you did it, but in terms of, I'm sorry to cut you off, but the, the utility of that would be that you've learned something that you can share with everybody and that yes. we can support you in it. So right. it's like a one-page document. Th these are the key things that I've learned that would provide new opportunities for what we all recognize is a huge <coughs> problem that we were trying to resolve. Mm -hmm. So that kind of outcome of what's, what's tangible in the end of this, I think, is more along the lines of a SMART goal. And I just think you're going to do it anyway. I'm just asking you to publicly share mm -hmm. what you've learned. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to Dr. Voss's point in the first one, I, mean, I think it's viable that we, and, and I like the fact that you're talking about annual achievement targets, um, and I, 
Um, I also agree it's going to take a while, but maybe if you added a little bit more information about what kind of targets you're referring to, because most people are not familiar with the accountability system. So, you know, I like the way you, you say, given the size of the current achievement gap, this is going to require attention for many years. That said, by the end of this year, you would hope that, um, and take it right out of the, take it right out of our accountability system, but, you know, the, achieve, the attendance will increase by 4%, the SAT scores will increase mm -hmm. by 2%, the, uh, S the MCAS scores will increase by whatever we need in order to meet that growth target, I think would become, would help a little bit in the discussion about that being specific, which is, I know what you're trying to do. I, right. I'm not right. arguing with what this says, but right. and being more explicit. Yeah, and I, I guess the only reason, the only reason they're not explicitly stated in there is they haven't been published yet. Okay. So, right. you know, we could hold off, we could hold off on the goal until the, the next targets are hit, but they're still they're still developing the analysis on that. So we don't have targets from last year for what we're trying to achieve this year. No. Okay. Thank you. I didn't know that. Okay. And then the last one, um, this one I think deserves a little explanation. Is, is the second, the superintendent's second goal is is new, um, and this is about. Um, in order to provide students with more equitable learning experience of experiences, I will direct efforts to close achievement gaps between schools and subgroups of students. Um, and this was a really rich conversation we had and we reflected a lot upon our quarterly meetings around student achievement or student success. Um, I will say that I highlighted the fact that one of our elementary schools um, tends to be lacking um, compared to the other ones in terms of uh, achievement data. Uh, and other data, and it's been going on for a long time. So um, because this is a district goal, we decided not to highlight one particular elementary school. I think that was smart. But now looking at it, I'm a little lost in what actually is behind this. So can you explain when you say I will direct efforts to close achievement gaps? I think you've been doing that for years. <laughs> so what's new and what do you expect to happen this year that would potentially pull up the schools that are not um, achieving as much as our two or higher performing school, elementary schools? Well, there's a number of new supports that have been added to the schools this year. Um, I, I think that um, another thing that will really be impactful is finally documenting our curriculum. Um, when you don't have a fully documented curriculum or any curriculum as it was for many years, the most at-risk learners are the ones who struggle Mm -hmm. the most. Um, so that, in fact, is new. Um, also, the fact that it, it can't be, um, for that school that you're talking about, the differences in the enrollment between that school and the other schools cannot be um, ignored. And we're in the process of evening that out at the um, budget and property meeting today. We were looking at projections and seeing how things were leveling out that will have an impact as well. Um, also focusing on the performance of the subgroup, which um, is also not equally distributed among all the schools will help. So all those things. Thank you, thank you very much. I mean, so again, I would, I would ask that maybe you, you're vague about directing efforts here, it's a, vague, it's a kind of a vague comment. I would encourage you to add some of the things you said. I will direct efforts to close achievement, such as um, this is likely to occur as a result of the final, finalizing the curriculum, extra supports at this particular school, acknowledging the higher percentage high needs in this particular school, which may require additional, I don't know what it's going to require, but it seems like you have something in mind. But again, because this is a public document and people will look at it and will look at it as saying, was this successful or not? And can we support you in the budget with accomplishing your goals? I think that would be helpful overall. With that said, I would also just convey that the superintendent did share that information with us at subcommittee and that was one of the reasons why we felt comfortable moving forward and, and supporting the goals. And he did share that information with us, but not with the whole committee. This is a new goal, it's the first time I've seen it, so that's why I'm Well, the, the, the information in regards to uh, written curriculums and having that available. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel okay with that? Then? I don't want to put words in your mouth. I mean, I, you, you feel well, it's more than necessary, or do you? 
Well, I think that it should be a vote of the whole committee. Yeah. But I, the, the, one, the only one thing I do feel uncomfortable with this about mm -hmm. is when we met as a subcommittee, we specifically decided to write it this way so as not to stigmatize one school, and now we're talking about one school. And I don't think it's a big secret, and we share quarterly meetings, and we constantly bring up one school, and I haven't named the school, but I don't see why it needs to be a secret, but I haven't, I still haven't named the school, and I don't think I've asked you to do anything other than add the language that you suggested, which still would not identify the school, but I think it's actually it's your goal, and it's a district goal, but I don't think we need to skirt around the issue that one of our schools is uh, struggling a lot more than our other three and that we have two very high performers that we probably can learn something from. So I'm not asking you to name the school and concentrate on that school, but I do think, as you said, there are some actions that you want to take that's going to build the performance of all schools, but hopefully, especially the schools that are behind. So my question would be, Mr. Oh, Meyer. Since there's a rich literature and, and achievement gap you know, analysis going back to Brown versus Board and, and Education has been struggling with this for decades. I think it might be um, a, a great thing if the superintendent could come up with a reading list for the incoming school committee and the, and the school committee members who are continuing. I mean, just one of the difficulties is that when the gap, I'm just looking at Stanford Center for Education Policy Analysis, about 80% of the gap is accounted for by what they roll in. They roll it into a socioeconomic disparities index, which is income gap, parent, parent education gap, poverty ratio, and unemployment ratio. These are things that are very hard for schools and school systems to affect. Um, not impossible, but that's 80%. And it just so happens that Massachusetts is the third worst state uh, in the United States after Connecticut and the District of Columbia in that socioeconomic disparity. Um, just strangely, we are in a region where Latinx, um, white gaps have not been closing as fast as they have. The good news is that gaps have been closing consistently. But again, I think it would, what Ms. Voss says about you know, trying to understand the root causes, it is important. And I think that that is the kind of you know, reading that can be done outside of school committee meetings and would enrich the perspectives on the superintendent's work as he undertakes this. I mean, again, I've been here 10 years. These gaps have been you know, pretty consistent. It's not for lack of trying. But again, the 20% that's not explained is, the, is that that should be the, the stuff that we can get to. Well, in response to that, I would just say, yes, we've been talking about it for a long time. So if it's going to be a goal, there needs to be something that's measurable. And I think it's the superintendent's job to bring that to us. It's not our job to figure out all of this, right? We want to support him and we want to say that's an important goal and provide money in the budget. But how do we? Are there ways to go about and do this? And I still maintain, I think this could be a lot more specific. I'm having trouble knowing how we're going to measure it. And that's why I was trying to put a short term idea in there. Um, and going to the second goal, which I guess is a new one, I. I, I guess I just have, I'm trying to understand these. They're just not very detailed. Is it mainly focused on MCAS scores or are there other um, achievement gap measures that will be used in measuring this goal? It's mainly focused on MCAS scores. And would you say that's the same with goal one, the first one? Yes. So. Although there are other, there are other accountability measures besides achievement. I. I would like to see us broaden our view of what our students can do past MCAS. We've talked about all sorts of things across the year. I don't know all the acronyms, but there's other ways of measuring how students are doing. And if we really want to get at this, as Mr. Meyer said, and understand it, um, I think we have to look past MCAS, too. MCAS is a piece of it, but there's more. Um, my, my concern in number two is the same. What? what are we going to measure in terms of, it says given, given the size of the current achievement gap, this goal is expected to require attention for many years, but what are we going to measure to see that we're making progress and to um, help us figure out the next budget so that we can continue making progress? So I understand what you're asking, yeah. but the, the goal identifies the measures in the, Ma the Massachusetts accountability system. 
Mr. Meyer? Yeah, just, just so people don't misunderstand, by MCAS you're not just talking about the, you know, what we think of as the MCAS test, but you're also talking about attendance, you're also talking about grade, four-year graduation rate, five-year graduation rate, those, those kind of things. Okay. Ms. Allen. Um, and I've, Am I wrong to think that part of this question can be answered by the decision of the subcommittee on what evidence you will choose to support, to present to us in support of these goals? And that's another way in which this discussion, so while you may have it broad here, in subcommittee you may say, and to show us you know, your progress towards these goals, we agree that this is the evidence we'd like to see. And that's another way to kind of um, Fine tune the discussion of what it, of what evidence you're going to support. You know, show us that that you're you're doing what you're saying you're doing. Is the discussion around what evidence? I, I'm just saying, rather than being like, uh, there are two ways to do it, and I think one is to be like really uber specific in the actual goal, and the other would be to be very specific about what types of evidence you think would show progress towards a more general goal. Like to be very specific about the evidence you'd like to see. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, so last July, I had a lot of trouble evaluating as a general, and, and it's very clear there's a subcommittee, but we're all supposed to evaluate. And I didn't understand the goals well enough and felt like I hadn't asked the right questions earlier and it wasn't fair to be critical. And I feel like now I want to make sure I understand what we're doing so that um, it's fair. And I'm, I'm trying to do this in a way to make them them better, right? And if you read the directions on this form, it says measurable. And, um, you know, measurable goals, I, I don't see, I, I think these goals um, are, are good places to go, but the, the way they're put out there and the um, way they're written could be greatly improved and could help us as a committee to get further and to make better progress if we have specific measurable things just like it asked for. Well, so the first one is yours, you would agree is measurable though, right? That we just don't have the number to put in specifically yet to say what the measure is, whereas we're saying that we're, the measure is to meet the annual achievement target. In, by when? Well, it's, annual. it's identified every year. I'm going to add something here. I'm just being uncomfortable with this thing. I, I don't think that it's fair to, for a couple of different reasons, uh, fair to base too much of anybody's evaluation on test scores. I mean, I think that stands true for teachers and administrators. Um, a lot of it has to do with what Downey mentioned about how so much of test scores um, has to do with factors which are completely out of their control. And um, so I, I think if you, if and then the other reason is because of tests themselves and what they measure and, and you know, basically the sort of the cultural incompetence of tests. Um, <laughs> and so there's a good deal of what they're measuring is exactly whether or not you're a member of the subgroup. So as opposed to your academic achievement. So I, you know, so I have a lot of problems with putting too much weight on the test score part of this, but I think there are some other things that are measurable here. So for example, in this one, the very first one, about prioritizing improving supports and services, you can, that, that measures the effort that is put out as opposed to the outcome. And I think that's absolutely measurable. I mean, you can, you can measure whether or not a person spent time doing those things, and if they did or didn't. And, and if they didn't, well then obviously it wasn't prioritized. So, I, I, and that's the part actually that I think focus needs to be on, just like I think it's the same focus for all the evaluations that happen in this district. Um, it really is on what is the person doing, which is really what they have control over. In many cases, they don't have very much control at all over, you know, the, the test scores that are the result of it. I mean, they, it, it, has a, it does have an impact on the test scores, but it's a, it's a small piece of that. It's not like a, a straight one-to-one. -one. It's not a video game that any of these people are operating. Can I try to summarize the direction I think I'm hearing from the committee, which is to write the student learning goal not in terms of the student learning uh, the, the demonstrable student learning gains, which are typically looked for in a, a student learning goal, but as a list of um, priorities for school committee members to support in terms of uh, moving the district forward with this subgroup, 
um, actions that I'll be looking for you to support in the budget for this goal and um, things of that nature rather than specifying what I think whether or not we'll get to any kind of outcome equity. Is that? I, that would, I think so. Okay. Well, I, I hear that from a few people. You know, I've sat on the committee long enough and I have a working relationship with the superintendent and a level of trust that I've always listened to him speak and admired the hard work and dedication that he puts into identifying areas that he can make the district better by identifying areas that he thinks are high priorities. And then as a professional, I've always stood back and let him take the lead on that and then hear back from him from time to time and trust that by the time it comes to evaluate him, he will show me the evidence along with the other group members of the work that's been done and the outcomes that have been achieved. And then from there, another year comes and more, more goals are set or we continue down that same path. So um, I'm not really in favor of that. I kind of like the way that it's been done before, but I'm not going to be here in another couple hours, so it's going to be all up to you guys. But I will say this, that um, the superintendent's doing one heck of a job, and I think that if we start looking at trying to micromanage the level that I'm hearing tonight, it's going to be really hard for him to be as effective and the great leader that he has been for the last several years. Yes, Ms. Hennessy. Um, I'm going to be a little off, but I like that these are team goals because I think that, and I believe, so I'm not, I think this is measurable. I think <coughs> for me, we have students identifying this as a, as a goal. Um, for me personally, as a school community member and as a parent, I see this as a really important thing that we as a district and you and our school leaders um, have to lead. Um, um, so I see it, I don't want it to be too prescriptive because I think that could be too narrowing. Um, I, I see that there's a lot of evidence that you could provide and how are you going to improve supports and services and I would imagine that the many school committee meetings where you present evidence um, is what's going on with the schools between and among the schools and students and the gaps and then to give evidence of how you and your team went about doing this like to me that's I'm interested in hearing I don't think you know what it, it all those things are going to be right now that it's it's a goal because that's what you're going to focus on mm -hmm. so for me I, l I like that part of it and I think that the accountability system are you required to put that in the first goal my training is you are yeah that's so <laughs> I, I think it's I, actually I think it is absolutely required and I don't necessarily agree with that at, at Howard I, but the accountability system also has um, you know how many students are taking advanced classes how many so these are things that we've been concerned about as a district or as a committee. Um, so I like the goals. I don't. I like that it's not that prescriptive. And for me, as a reader, to me, I know what you're going to work on. Um, so that's me weighing in. I'm sorry that I didn't before. So I think. So I think at the end of this, we need. We're, our goal, the end goal of this, is to vote on what our goal, what the goals are for the superintendent. So to the extent that people want changes, I think um, so you have to. Let's make a motion to like propose a change and and then let's vote on it as a school committee and then let's go on because I just I feel like we can't we, uh, we can't go back and re recreate the subcommittee so now we're at the full committee and so let's okay. so if you if there's take goal yeah, one uh, which is no. a team goal and make a motion and uh, so yeah. I'll move to accept these goals um, okay just to get it on the table so okay so there's been a motion made and seconded so now I'd, I would entertain amendments that people have to the goals or specific amendments I still have some questions I'm, I'm probably not gonna suggest amendments I might as we go forward suggest reflection and maybe bringing them back I'm not sure I'm making my comments and sure. you know I, I think they're also friendly comments and the superintendent wants to rewrite them because he thinks they're gonna be helpful and help us measure them he can do that, and if he thinks they're better the way they are, I respect that. Okay. Um, but I do have a couple other questions. Um, I'm surprised there isn't a goal about looking, reflecting in some way on the WINS model slash the, what's going on in the elementary schools right now. And I just put that out there because I think we are going to spend a lot of time on that, and my thinking is very much affected by the retreat we had where we were, it said, you know, not necessarily your goals, but as a school committee, we need to be focused on things that are important in our district and what we're 
we started this wins model, we're in year three. There's a lot of things that have been good that I think we can celebrate, but there's also a lot of things that um, could be improved and just taking space to reflect on what those are, making space to have conversations with parents and teachers and whoever else, and coming back as part of the summer and saying, you know, this is where we're at, this is what we need money from our budget to fix what isn't working as well. So that's just a friendly thing to say. I would think that making a space for that would be something that might be considered. And another goal that I felt like could be considered is, um, and this is really new, um, but it's pretty clear to me right now that our district needs to define and document a process for how we search for principals at our schools. And um, whether or not that's a goal, I don't know, but I think it needs to happen. So. I'll be done. So any other comments or additional suggestions? Or, or, or amendments, actually, frankly, because we're really at the point where we've been presented this by a subcommittee like any other policy, and now we have to vote on it. And we can amend it, we can make additions to it, um, we can give suggestions, but at the end of the day, we're, we're setting goals for the, the leader of our school district, and, and then we're going to be measuring them throughout the course of the year. Any other amendments? Any amendments? I actually have a question. Sure. I guess, so Dr. Provost, with respect to what Dr. Voss just said, do you think, because we have heard a lot about the WINS model, is there, an, uh, is there a place in these goals where you feel like you're explicitly going to be looking at that WINS model? I see that second goal as part of that, but do you, know, would, would, mm -hmm. you think it would be beneficial to be explicit about that? Or? Well, uh, maybe just to, to reflect on where my mind is going hearing Dr. Voss's comments. What I hear you saying is that you, both with respect to the first goal and with respect to what you had to say about wins, you're, you're wanting a goal that has to do with the building of the budget. I mean, both of them have to do with the building of the budget, which I've never really had as a goal. It just seems like something that the superintendent has to do to get you know the process started. But I, if that, would help to address some of some of the um, concerns. I would certainly be open to some kind of a amendment around a um, proposed goal around you know the budget you know, proposal. I mean, we had talked at budget and property today about sharing some of the data that I was sharing with you all as um, so which what happened to be about the wins model for those of you who aren't there um, as part of the beginning of the budget process. So. That certainly is something I'm planning on doing. I have no problem at all with that being a goal. I just, um, in terms of putting it into a bucket, I guess I didn't really see it as a bucket because it, I don't see it as a student learning goal or a district improvement goal or professional practice. I'd see it kind of as the duty that the superintendent has every year to get the budget process started. But again, like many of these things, they're things I'm going to be doing anyways that certainly wouldn't object to having a goal around the budget. Okay. So, the, so do you have an idea about how you would want to incorporate that, Ms. Hennessy? No, I, I really wanted to know if he thought it should be, okay. actually. You know, because it's been something that people have been brought up. Okay. No, I'm, I'm actually comfortable with these goals. Okay. Any other, any other folks have amendments or things they want to offer? Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded to, to set the, approve these goals for uh, Dr. Provost for the 2019-2020 school year. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? I'm abstaining. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, that, we now move on to a discussion, uh, a report actually, on the new superintendent evaluation pilot program. Um, which um, at a prior meeting, I believe, um, uh, I think Ms. Voss made a motion that we study that or we sent to the Rules and Policy Committee for study or some rules, I think, I think it's the Superintendent, superintendent Evaluation, evaluation uh, Committee uh, right. to study, um, which is why I'll now throw you a curveball by having the <laughs> Chair of Rules and Policy <laughs> explain it, but the Chair of Rules and Policy and her role as an MASC member went to a fairly extensive presentation on it, so um, we were just helping you keep us a quick report about it. 
Yeah, so um, I was able to attend um, a session on it at the conference in Hyannis, and then more recently, um, on the 25th of November, I was able to attend um, the drive-in on superintendent evaluation at Assabet Valley Regional Technical High School. It was put on by Claire Abbott, who's the manager um, for uh, pre-K through 12 um, educator effectiveness for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, Tom Scott, who's the executive director of the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents. Glenn Kucher, the executive director of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Um, and Dorothy Presser, the um, MASC field representative. Um, they covered a lot. It, we spent the morning there, um, and I'm happy to share any of the information um, with the committee. but really just around the question of whether or not to employ the pilot. Um, to me, there was it was a pretty clear, uh, clearly the, the better model for us to adopt. Um, it reduces the 39 elements to just 21 indicators. So it's designed around the 21 indicators from the standards effective, of effective administrative leadership. Um, it includes descriptions of a superintendent's practice for each indicator and it articulates the specific responsibilities that a school committee may be expected to reasonably evaluate. So that's a significant departure from the really detailed element level um, rubrics that were associated with other educator rules in the model system for educator evaluation. Um, what they really focused on was that um, describing practice at the indicator level rather than at the element level. It acknowledges the unique components of um, the, an educator evaluation process that's conducted by a school committee. So the four areas they talked about was the role of the school, school committee, that our role is governance and not management, and um, we should be focusing on the what and the why, which is governance, rather than the how, which would be management, and that the indicator rubric does that. Um, they also talked about the composition of a school committee. Um, we're the only evaluator that's comprised of multiple individuals, and so rather than a single single evaluator, um, and so this kind of requires consensus building, um, and so the indicator rubric um, would make this exponentially easier uh, because it's focused just on those um, f it's fewer descriptors of practice. Um, they also talked about how the focus of a school committee, um, many of us are not educators, um, and we focus primarily on the outcome of a superintendent's work rather than the details of implementation, and this um, indicator rubric would guide the school committee um, to maintain that focus. And then finally, it's a public process. Um, the superintendent's evaluation is the only educator evaluation that happens in a public meeting, um, and this indicator rubric includes the practices to what to which a committee can reasonably ex, um, be expected um, to uh, have access or insight so it makes it more accessible both to us and to the public so that that public process of collecting and evaluating evidence um, can be conducted with both integrity and transparency. Um, and so this is the pilot for this year, and Desi's running. Um, they're expecting feedback, particularly around the questions of is it accessible and relevant to all involved, and does it promote a co comprehensive evaluation of superintendent practice, does it support consistency and transparency in aspects, aspects of the evaluation process, including analyzing evidence, providing feedback, and using professional judgment to determine ratings. Um, the expectation is, is that while they may make adjustments to it, this is not a one-year thing, that this will be put into permanent practice um, and that we can expect to use this in the future. It's completely compatible with both the one-year evaluation cycle and a two-year evaluation cycle, which they're recommending for superintendents who have more than three years of experience. Um, so yeah, there were absolutely no drawbacks to using the pilot, um, and it seems that it would definitely be um, be a good thing for us to adopt um, as a committee. So I think that's it. I have plenty of documents if anybody wants me to forward them on to you. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, 
questions for Ms. Fallon about the information? Yep, Mr. Collins. Um, thank you for sharing that. It was my understanding that this year um, you could pilot it, but next year it's going to be required. Um, are they, did they change that? or? They, the, so that, that hasn't, I don't think, been decided. I think this year they're piloting it. They're going to see, I think, what the feedback is because it was adopt or adapt pilot was the kind of for this year model. And so there's the expectation that next year it won't be optional, but um, I think that that will largely depend on the feedback. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, thank you for the presentation and then I guess um, turn back to the chair of the evaluation committee and uh, there's a uh, vote whether or not to participate in the pilot. Right, so we have a vote this evening to participate in the superintendent evaluation pilot program. Again, at subcommittee, we discussed this. Um, I think in your packets, you received a PowerPoint that kind of goes through the changes. Uh, Ms. Fallon was asked to speak about it this evening. We left the meeting in support of the pilot, but wanted to hear back from Ms. Fallon. We knew that she was, I think, that day or right around there at conference getting information, and we felt like if there was something glaring that came out of it that may have, um, you know, needed to be shared with the full committee that it, we shouldn't be moving forward with this. We'd want to hear about that and weigh in um, at full committee, but hearing that it was a positive um, kind of uh, support for it at the meeting, I think that was the only thing that we wanted to hear from subcommittee to, to finalize our, our comfort moving forward. So are you going to make a formal motion that we... So I would make a, a motion to participate in the superintendent evaluation pilot program for this uh, evaluation cycle for the superintendent. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion? Any... Uh, yes, Ms. Wisconsin. So I'm curious, I guess, more about sort of the implementation of this pilot. So I appreciate, you know, moving from, you know, thanks for your overview and that moving from 39 to 21 indicators definitely sounds more reasonable and looking at the indicators, et cetera, what could we as a school committee really reasonably be expected to evaluate? But right now, so much of our evaluation happens in subcommittee among the three people who are on the subcommittee with Dr. Provost. I'm just curious in this pilot, is it, does it work differently? Just kind of what are the logistics or how it works or if anyone knows. And I guess I could watch the five part video series which I still <laughs> have yet to do. Can I just suggest that really quick? Um, so that was actually one of the big conversations both at the conference and, and, and at this meeting was how committees are dividing the work and, um, and I think that that's something that, that we can decide but um, I know that Amherst Pelham Regional was one of the presenters at, um, that Nakajima presented at the, at the conference on Hyannis. And so he was following sort of the same guidelines that they were presenting at DESE where you would essentially do most of the work in subcommittee around um, agreeing upon the goals and then bring it to the full committee for a vote and then go back and agree on um, what kind of evidence are you going to be using and how um, how will what will you be doing with it and one of the conversations was when dr. provost said he, you know they provide hundreds of pages of evidence one of the things they talked about was having a drop box so that we weren't actually getting a data dump you know two days mm -hmm. or four days before the meeting that we could kind of keep up with it as it went on through the year and periodically be um, updated on on your progress um, and then um, and then coming back to the full committee for updates. And so it was kind of a back and forth process mm -hmm. um, that they were recommending where a lot of the heavy lifting was done in subcommittee, but then it was coming back to the full committee for votes. The most complicated part where it seems that most committee, where many committees were using different processes was in that compilation of of evaluations when the full committee was doing the evaluation because it comes into an open meeting lot question because it's technically a deliberation and so there needs to be really thoughtful um, discussion about how you're going who's going to be assigned whether you're going to do it in a workshop model where we all sit down in a publicly posted meeting and fill out evaluation forms and then discuss them then where you're assigning an outside person who's not a school committee member to collect all of the evaluations and compile them um, whether you're going to um, have your chair or vice chair be in charge of doing that and then 
it needs to be at the very same time, I guess, that it's shared with the full committee. It needs to be posted publicly so that it's not considered a deliberation. So those are the sorts of questions mm -hmm. that we do need to sort of address, but and mm -hmm. that's where the most variation seems to happen. But there was definitely a move towards having um, a lot of the more complicated discussions and um, negotiations happening in subcommittee and then having it all come back to the full committee mm -hmm. for votes and for the evaluation. Got it. But so it did differ depending on mm -hmm. th that process doesn't change regardless of whether you're using the pilot or the, mm -hmm. the elements. So it'll sort of be up to the new subcommittee. Yeah, really it will be. Yeah. To <laughs> sort of work with Dr. Provost to make those decisions and then bring those decisions back to the mm -hmm. full committee for yeah, uh, and how we're going to. And that's where we can also that. reach out to other committees and ask, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds like Amherst has, they're, they're part of that five part video series mm -hmm. and they do talk about how happy they've been and how it's taken them a few years but they've really streamlined the process mm -hmm. and how happy they are with it. Mm -hmm. because it's a lot more complicated for those regional school systems when they've got various towns and mm -hmm. school right, committees right. evaluating a yeah. superintendent. It's really in their best interest to have that process be really well managed. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Mr. Kaufman? So just a quick comment. I think one of the reasons that we all, um, Ed, Molly, myself, and Dr. Provost, all agreed that it would be worthwhile to move into the pilot um, we, we discussed a number of reasons. We also advantages. One of the other reasons is that there'll be at least uh, two of the three members to this evaluation subcommittee will be new. So it, it just makes sense that if, you're, if we're all learning something new, what it almost seems to be a step backward to try and learn an existing process that's only going to change in the in the very near future. So there's another advantage. I think that makes a lot of sense to us. Other questions or comments? Okay, so the motion on the table then is to um, vote to adopt uh, to participate in the superintendent evaluation pilot. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that vote is successful. Um, now we'll turn to some reports from our various subcommittees, and we have a report first from the budget and property subcommittee meeting, and I believe Ms. Busansky will be giving that report. Thank you. So uh, the budget and property subcommittee meeting has uh, subcommittee has met twice, um, both times falling on the day of the school committee meeting. So it never makes it onto the agenda, though it was publicly posted, meeting all open meeting law rules. But um, we, as you know, you referred to us. The first issue was the phys ed requirement at the high school, which about four years ago we changed into this wellness phys ed requirement, these um, uh, outings sort of twice a year, uh, and we were looking at it from the financial perspective of costing almost 50000 to give our students a sort of a um, phys ed experience that didn't seem to really measure up to what anyone had really it met the letter of the law, but it didn't really meet the spirit of the law in terms of what we really wanted for our kids in terms of phys ed. So uh, thanks to Dr. Provost and interim principal Valancourt, we were able to, um, and Miss Lamica, we were able to really sit and um, dig into those numbers and uh, over the course of the two meetings, um, uh, Ms. Valancourt has met with, has surveyed students and teachers, uh, met with uh, teachers, the wellness teachers and phys ed teachers at the high school and is going to come and present to us in January where their thinking is on how to alter the phys ed requirement so that it would be more meaningful and start to look at the possibility of counting um, sports as an actual, uh, to meet the phys ed requirement including external, in addition to that, sorry, outside um, aerobic activity is what we came up with as the name, um, counting that as well, and then some other opportunities within the school, um, and ex especially with the X block coming next year, some opportunities to actually include more phys ed opportunities within the school day, and so that kids could meet that physical ed requirement. Um, in a more meaningful way and um, at either, you know, keeping it at the same cost or less. We're not really sure at this time. So, but um, again, Ms. Valancourt will be here in January. She's working with the teachers and staff on this and she'll present to us uh, more about that issue and discuss it more fully. So, um, 
it's been a couple good issues. So that was the first. Um, next, uh, though, in no particular, well, some particular order, um, we did discuss um, the issue of seat belts that also had been referred to us, and um, uh, Ms. Lamica presented on that uh, the bus contract and the um, fact that we are not going to be going out to bid for another bus contract till 2022. Right now, there's no law in the books. Um, Massachusetts law saying that we need to have the seat belts on our buses. We have them on our own school buses, mm -hmm. on our Northampton owned school buses. Um, but the bus contract with Durham does not include seat belts. Um, if we want to include that, we can include it in our bid process, which we would put out in 20. Oh, sorry. Am I getting that right? 2022 would be the bid and the contract in 2023. That's basically two school committees from now. So just to put that into perspective. So we can revisit that at a later date. In the meantime, we did talk about field trips where kids, students were uh, being driven on the highway and that at faster speeds, seatbelts are a more pressing issue. And um, uh, Dr. Provo said that uh, our transportation director, Ms. Lieber, I get it, Tammy, mm -hmm. it, we can look into bus companies that offer seatbelts and we can include in the field trip form a checkbox just asking if um, the uh, staff teachers running the field trip have looked into the possibility of a seatbelt just to encourage um, folks planning field trips to look into that at that time. We wouldn't, um, it's not mandatory, it's just encouraged at this time. So. I think it's, uh, well, as we kind of progress with this issue, issue and we get closer to the bus bid, we can then look into ways that we can include the possibility of um, having seatbelts as part of the bid and what that actually means. And by then, for all we know, the law may have changed and it might be required. So that'll certainly be interesting to see. Um, as Dr. Provost referenced already, we talked about budget implications uh, with winds and our high needs future and how we can incorporate um, where we're at now that we're at year three into our um, budget process, which we will start in January, February. So you'll be hearing more about that. Um, and then last, I'm gonna just, we talked about electric buses and I'm gonna turn that over to Dr. Voss. Okay, so um, uh, Ms. Lieber brought some information and others of us contributed some information about electric school buses. Um, right now the way our busing is arranged is we have a contract with Durham. I think there's 10 buses, is that right? And then we own on the order of four buses. Mm -hmm. And so um, we mostly focused on talking about the future if we're going to buy buses, um, so not part of the contracted buses. Um, and Ms. Lever presented what she thought our future needs were in terms of sizes of buses, and she'd done quite a bit of work at looking into what might be available in terms of electric school buses. The history is there's been a pilot program in Massachusetts with three districts um, around 2015 onward to now. And Amherst participated, so locally we have some history. We spent some time talking about that. There were certainly some um, concerns as it went on, but a lot of really good energy around electric school buses. As the technology grows, it's widely recognized that this is where we need to move to for all sorts of reasons. I, I won't go into all of it now. Um, but in terms of where we're at, we're keeping a close eye on it. Uh, Ms. Lieber done some really great research to find out our DPW uses a company, what is the name of the company? Uh, the, the company that builds all of our trucks and maintains them. I'll come up with it, I'm just losing it. But I have they're starting, international, international thank yes. you. Yes. yes, they're starting to look at their own pilot program in terms of electric school buses and a big issue with electric school buses is having um, maintenance available for them. So one of the pilot problems was the company that provided the electric school buses was in Canada and if they broke it took a long time to get them back on the road. So for that reason um, we're, in, we're keeping up to date with it, going to keep following it. Um, also uh, encouraging us to keep talking to Amherst. Amherst, you might have seen today's paper in fact, um, is really trying to promote electric school buses and has some experience with them and one of the things that's been brought up is if we go in that route in the future, we could definitely combine resources in terms of maintenance costs. Um, the other 
exciting thing about electric school buses is there's a lot of grant money for them right now. They're very expensive, but the problems that Volkswagen had a couple years ago about lying in terms of their emissions has led to some very generous grants. And the first cycle just closed, um, but you could get a school bus, an electric school bus, probably cheaper than what a regular school bus would cost, although that it's a little more complicated once you need to build the infrastructure and such. Um, so we're, we're keeping an eye on that, and Ms. Lieber's going to continue to watch the Volkswagen um, grant money, and there's going to be a second cycle of it. So I guess stay tuned. Okay. I can say that as the chair of the PBTA advisory board, um, PBTA is, is acquiring um, electric buses uh, through the Volkswagen money. A lot of um, regional transit authorities are getting some of that Volkswagen money to, yeah. to do buses. But Maybe, Can I add one more thing? Sure. I think it's really interesting. Different states are looking at different models for this, and in the state of Virginia, people might have read about this, the actual power industry, the electric utility industry in Virginia is supporting electric school buses, and they're trying, their goal is to get, I think, 2,000 on the road over the next few years. Um, one of the issues we have up here is the cold weather. It's less of an issue in Virginia. But these electric school buses are being viewed as ways of them exp expanding what they need to do to provide power. Um, there's, there's two benefits. One is you have these giant batteries on these school buses. And if you can charge them with the sun in summer or off school days, they actually can probably 10 years from now, the technology will be there that these batteries can run air conditioners and buildings. So there's a lot of interesting things coming down the route. And all of the electric school buses in Virginia will have seat belts. So. Electrically powered. Will they be driverless? That's the idea. They ought to click in and click out. OK. So does that conclude your report from budget and property, Ms. Busey? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks to the committee for that. Um, now we'll turn to the Rules and Policy Subcommittee and a report from Ms. Fallon and some first and second readings on the uh, on some policies. Thanks. Um, so first up, we have a policy BEDB, agenda format. It's the first reading. Um, just to remind you, um, the reason this is coming before us is there were a series of three policies that had, um, they weren't all in alignment. So the MASC recommended policy had um, the agenda being set by the chair. Um, our policy, which was last updated 16 years ago, had the agenda being set by the vice chair. And our actual current <coughs> practice is to have it being set by the chair the, and the vice chair. So really, that's why this is being addressed, as we wanted to just sort of get the committee to agree on what it is we're doing and put it into both policy and practice before the new term starts. But as tends to happen when we meet, we took it a little bit further than that. And so what you see reflected are some really significant changes um, in our way of thinking. And so what we had envisioned um, is that um, you know, the agenda belongs to us, the school committee. And um, I think that we have been um, sort of allowing, like requiring our chair and vice chair to sort of act as gatekeepers and having to make decisions about what shows up on the agenda and when. Um, and so what we were are suggesting with these policy changes is that essentially you all should have an attachment as well that shows a, an agenda template. And the only thing that would be automatically included on the agenda would be the roll call, the public comment period, announcements, and then recommended actions, which are the vote by consent agenda, which would be approval of minutes, budget transfers, and field trip requests. And then reports and recommendations, which would be donations, subcommittee reports, business report, personnel report, superintendent's report. Any other agenda item that anyone, whether it's the community member or a teacher or one of us wants to put on the agenda would come up under this new business item. And so we're hoping that you would approve the process whereby um, 
essentially anyone would be able to say um, I would move to have electric school buses put on the agenda and if there is a second uh, we would discuss it vote on it whatever and it would go on that's where the chair and vice chair conferring with the superintendent would decide on which future agenda it went as far as timing um, yeah you just shade it a little differently I think it would be voted on but not discussed to well, avoid so I, I conferred last night at the MASC meeting um, the board of directors meeting with Glenn Kucher and he said it's actually we could discuss why we wanted it or didn't want it on it because the open meeting law is the chair couldn't have reasonably anticipated that that item would be brought up and if one of us is bringing it up then he's well so he was saying that we would be able to say <laughs> why or why not we wouldn't want it on a future agenda um, so so that's yeah so that's something we could decide later okay. but essentially it would come before the committee for a majority vote of whether we all agreed that it was worth our time and the community's time and everyone whether it's a priority to have an item or a presentation or whatever put on a future agenda and so that was what we were proposing with this but really the important item was that um, we have to decide whether who's who's making the agenda so we have the wording changed of the superintendent conferring with the chair and the vice vice chair of the school committee um, just to reflect our current practice um, we'll arrange the order of items on a meeting agenda so that the committee can accomplish its business as expeditiously as possible. Uh, we added in language that said each agenda will include customary items of business as listed in the attached informational document, which is the one I was referencing, and then um, just modified the language in our prior document that said to say additional items of business may be suggested by any school committee member, staff member, or citizen. Anyone who wishes to have a topic scheduled on the agenda should submit the request in writing to the superintendent or any member of the school committee. Uh, the inclusion of such items will be determined by a majority vote of the school committee during the new business portion of the meeting in consultation with the superintendent. Um, and then that the agenda together with supporting materials should be distributed to school committee members at least 48 hours prior to the meeting to permit adequate time to prepare for the meeting. Agendas will be posted in accordance with Massachusetts open meeting law and we added the legal reference. So I know it's a first reading and it was a radical change. Oh. Do you guys have questions? <laughs> so yeah, I just have a, a sort of logistical question. So somebody emails the superintendent and says, I'd like to put this on as a possible agenda item and it goes under new business. We'll use electric school buses. Does it get a bullet, electric school buses under new business and then we sit here, we have five bullets and we vote on them? If that's the model, I don't think the open meeting law is an issue really because it's on there. But if it's just new business and we go around and raise our hand and say, oh, I had somebody say they want this on it, that does feel like an open meeting issue. If it was just a straight ministerial, like I'd like to put on the next agenda, but I, I do worry that if then it's debated that you're, how do you avoid not discussing the merits of it? Like if, if, if we have a, dis we don't, if, five of us want electric school buses on the agenda and five of us don't or whatever the breakdown is people are going to be saying why they do or don't want the school community to take up electric school buses. I just think it's going to be hard not to bleed over into a deliberation yeah. and then people at home are like what the heck where did this come from uh, and like I'm going to get in my car and run down there because I want to tell them they should move for electric school buses but they weren't given notice because it wasn't on the meeting so yeah. so I think you'd run into problems with open meeting law that's just the problem. I, yeah, yeah, I think I, think I just, right. I just, that's the challenge. And I think, you cannot. But I very that. specifically asked them. I like. I don't know. I feel like if we pay them a lot of money. Okay. If we, if I, I, think that, I think it's also there is a split. You know, you, you you would take a lot of discipline to where you weren't discussing the merits of electric school buses, mm -hmm. but you were discussing sort of whether or not that was the sort of thing the school committee ought to be talking about at these meetings, or whether or not it was really the sort of thing that transportation directors should be dealing with and and you know not not a public school meeting thing it'd be really you know it, it would take a lot of self-control for people not to talk about then why <laughs> why they were in favor of electric school buses and that's why it needed to be um, at the pub at the public at the meeting of the school committee but there would be a way to have a discussion of whether or not it should be on the agenda without discussing you know the substantive thing 
if you're just talking about sort of, you know, the whatever, the procedural part of it. But that's that's a really blurry line very frequently. Mr. Sands can then. Well, I just wonder if it was listed under new business, so there's a bullet for electric buses, right? Then and that's, we just, that's fine. But and then we are, and we are discussing it in a way that might bleed into deliberations since it's on the that's agenda. That's fine. I meant right. was the other alternative, which Mr. Kucher said you could just say new business. I, oh. I couldn't have anticipated that I was going to think of electric school buses, which is really not what the emergency clause of the open meeting law is that like mm -hmm. there was a snowstorm and the power was out mm -hmm. and the select board has to call an emergency meeting and we couldn't have anticipated that this was going to strike you know less than 48 hours that's what the emergency clause is not i just mm -hmm. thought of it because really you know that's not really an emergency you that's like i just thought of it tonight so therefore i can violate the open meeting law by bringing it up so i think that's where i so i think the idea of putting it on the agenda for the committee to decide. It's on the agenda, and then the committee can decide. So, I, you know, I don't know. But it does say, anyone who wishes to have a topic scheduled on the agenda, oops, sorry, my Wi-Fi thing keeps getting away there. Um, if I, uh, anyone who wishes to have a topic scheduled on the agenda should submit the request in writing to the superintendent or any member of the school committee and then it will be so i i'm reading this as it would have to be it would have to be under new business it wouldn't just come up it wouldn't be that i raise my hand and say oh i want to put seat, new any new business yes i'd yeah. like to put seat belts on it the would, next agenda it would almost not be new business it would almost be a category called next month's agenda or next meetings or agenda, agenda setting or something future yeah. agenda because even if you decided to put it on the agenda, that wouldn't necessarily mean that it would be on the next agenda. Because right. the next that agenda might be really, really full. And so it might be that it's simply on an agenda. Or we might decide it needs to go to budget and property first, or we might decide we need to wait till something. Right. So anyway, so it might not be new business, because it but we can really be reserved be all night. truly new business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Coffin, uh, Ms. Hennessy, did you have a question? First. Yeah, oh, it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, not, I'm confused with what you're trying to accomplish here. I thought initially you were talking about making it more expensive, like who decides what's on the agenda. Yeah. yeah. But now it kind of sounds like the opposite, like um, people can vote things off the agenda. So no, 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 no. <laughs> no, so we're saying... Like people can, if, if Dr. Voss said, I want to talk about an item... Um, electric buses. Electric buses. And for whatever reason, we said, no, we're not interested in that. Um, yeah. Now she yeah. doesn't have that opportunity to discuss it, whereas previously or currently she can speak to the three people who set the agenda and have it on there, and then she has the right to speak about it. So I'm trying to understand what does this accomplish? Does this add because or delete? Does this add more agenda items, or does this reduce agenda items? And does it actually? Make I would hope efficient? it would just reflect the will of the committee better. I mean, I don't that it would prioritize. It would show what our priorities were and make sure that we all were aware of what was coming before us and why. And it would make the whole process more transparent. Like we, I would like this on the agenda because, you know, um, and and that and that would be discussed. Like that would be a public declaration, not yeah. a surprise to us when we get mm -hmm. the agenda, and we're all like, wait, why is this on the agenda, or why am I giving a presentation, or do you know what I'm saying? Okay, so in that case, now I understand it a little bit better. Thank you. So in that case, isn't that going to delay? Would that would that potentially delay a process where you want to speak about buses, then we vote on whether it should be discussed, and then it's another two weeks or a month before it's on the agenda. I think and, that it, uh, it depends on whether what the action is. It could get referred to a subcommittee, so that would be more immediate, but depending on when that subcommittee meeting was taking place, or you're right, it could be on a future agenda. But so much of what we do is a month or two in advance, or happens regularly throughout the year as far as reports. Mm -hmm. Ms. My concern is that sometimes we lack discipline in, ta in talking. And so I would worry that it would become a much longer conversation, uh, making the meeting longer than it sometimes is. But again, in a couple hours, I'm not going to really <laughs> worry about that. <laughs> we're to prioritize. Actually, it gets into this qualifying discussion about why an issue is important. And I think that, to me, is the real danger of, um, I like transparency. I don't know if it, I think that's really important. but. 
sometimes that's where I think it could go really long. Why I want this next week or next whatever next month. Um, so I, I I like the transparency. I like that we're open about what we want on it. I, the danger for me is making these meetings longer than they already are um, because you have those words in it. So. Yeah, but I think that, I think that was the, I think sort of that's what your intent is because if if between now and the next agenda all nine of you say I'd like this on the agenda I'd like this on the agenda I'd like this on the and I just say okay I'll just put it on the agenda and then we get this huge long agenda Except and then that people I think that's what the concern is like it gives I I never like to say we don't put that on the or we don't have enough time for that I never like to say I, we should that doesn't belong on the agendas but I would like the body's input I suppose yeah. so yeah and so I, there could be cases where it could be helpful and I think it's the opposite as well I mean I think the other concern is sort of the you know back to the Wizard of Oz concern right about how how do things get on the agenda right and and the answer is you go and you talk to Ed or whoever is in that role and. Ed either discourages you from putting it on the agenda or, or he encourages it, but either way, you know, it's not the school committee that decides what's on the agenda. It's, it's something happening back here with me and Ed or me and the mayor or, you know, and, and so it's the, the question in both directions and both in terms of it being said, everything being said yes to and just sort of showing up on the agenda, even though maybe the rest, maybe the only person who wants it on the agenda is the person who asked you know, the people who make the agenda, or the opposite, it's not on the agenda because the, maybe the only person who doesn't want it is, you know, one of the people who makes up the agenda, right? And so, so that was sort of the concern was, you know, how do you, again, the obvious other concern is then just like everything else, we'd end up discussing it another time, which is, which is the downside. <laughs> if we end up discussing it when we're talking about whether or not to discuss it, and then we discuss it when we discuss it. That's really too bad. Um, so what I really like about this is I think it is much more transparent and we all know, okay, this is who we have to ask to get something on the agenda, but it says to our whole community, you know, if you have ideas, reach out to somebody and get it on the agenda. And, and, and so I, I, I like that. Um, That's actually our current policy, just so you know. know. Okay. I know that was interesting. That's why oh. But now we're talking That's about it. it, it but it's in yellow, so I didn't realize. It. Okay. Yeah. Um, but a question is, and I think Mr. Coffin might have said this: if there's something that really needs to be discussed more quickly than this lag time, right? New business. Does the say the superintendent um, have a way? to put something on without us voting it on. And I, I mean, I can see mm -hmm. all sorts of examples where there'd be more of a crisis that you'd want. Mm -hmm. I suspect you could amend the policy that we're presenting on our first reading next month. Sure. To, I, to put wording in for, for those exceptions, yeah. Well, there is new business, actually. So it was a real emergency that came up, you know, sometime in the last 48 hours. Um, then that's actually where new business is available under the open meeting law to do it. Um, if it's In my experience, those are not usually true emergencies. Yeah, I know. Right. They're, they're I know. dog ate my homework. Or, or I'm just saying they're, they're more yeah. like a grant deadline got missed or something. Yeah, they're not grant. like the kind of thing that would yeah. actually qualify for an emergency. Yeah. So, so then. That would be problem. But I think that the superintendent, I think, always, I thought, had a default to always put things that were important to the district on the agenda that were timely for the district, that were like district business, like contracts that need to be voted on. And yeah. just, I well, think those like all the other, the them. list of the standard list here is pretty right. inclusive, actually. Ms. B. Sands. I, I mean, what I, what I appreciate about this is the opportunity to, to open up that agenda setting. Um, uh, to not just school committee members, but to the community as well, which I think is really great and important. I wouldn't want to lose that piece which says um, it, w where we determine things it, within that month between school committees. Let's just say that second meeting is often predetermined. So that month between our general school committees, I still think we need that ability for, I, I would think, the superintendent chair, vice chair, to determine items that also need to be put on the agenda. I don't think it should be exclusive the other but I really do appreciate the part that opens this up more um, and maybe puts it listed under new business etc but um, 
it does seem like our practice has worked well to be able to say we need to put this on and it's not an emergency it's just meetings coming up this should go on the agenda Um, I, I also appreciate the thought behind this. I think I, I, I agree with Rebecca. I, I like the idea. I am not, I am also sensitive to what Ann suggested and I'm sensitive to the delay. I wonder if, and I'll think about this for next time, I know this is first reading, but I wonder if a, another way of approaching this would be just to firm up how things get on the agenda and mm -hmm. think that through um, with at least two of the agenda setting folks that have been doing this for a while think about what your experiences have been and how often it's a challenge to determine what is and what isn't on the agenda. I, I've never heard that perspective, but um, I just wonder whether the transparency of what ends up on the agenda, I, I like the notion of going there, I just don't like this particular strategy has me concerned, but maybe we can come up <laughs> with another one. Um, okay. And I had another quick Well, you got a month. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, clearly, I, I think we have to take into account that half the committee is changing. And right. People that are coming mm -hmm. are going to have their own thoughts and ideas. Um, regarding this suggested agenda template, um, I know we're not voting on that per se, but I'm just wondering when you look at this and the superintendent's report is there we, uh, under room numeral five, mm -hmm. we currently have a system that superintendent gives an update and then we don't have a chance to ask back and forth questions by placing it where you have here was that an, were you also thinking that the format of that might change that the format of us being able to after dr. Provost does his report um, it's usually at the end of the meeting and we right. say mm -hmm. it's on the same place so as the regular agenda yeah it's that hasn't changed that's a new discussion. That <laughs> yeah, that we we didn't yeah. think that we thought about a lot. We didn't think about that. <laughs> Mr. Meyer, did you have a question? Yeah, I have um, some. I have some really great ideas in this. But I'm just wondering about the, about the validity of this body doing a first reading when we won't exist. Normally, normally bodies do not take up items. Yeah. The last meeting because we're, as you've mentioned, we're, we're actually, this committee will be gone. There will be newly seated. So, committee. so the problem, the re, yeah, so we were kind of, we can hold off on this second reading. We just thinking that all the, right, but the problem was, was that we had started work on these groups of policies as a subcommittee and the rest of my subcommittee, it will be gone too. And so that's where we got, we had hoped to present these a month earlier. So this would have been a second meeting. So I do hear your validity. So I don't know. You can suspend rules and do two meetings, but I mean, that's when Congress, the legislature rolls over. Oh no, I was saying to do the opposite. We wanted, I wanted to at least get the first reading done while my colleagues okay. who worked on this with me were here. But I'm saying, as far as I'm concerned, we can do a third reading. I just really wanted it, I just really wanted it to be clear before the new term started that the policies that, like this one that had to do with the structure of whose responsibilities are what as far as the chair the vice chair and that there was no agreement with the city charger charter our policy our practice and the MASC policy that that was an issue that needed to be addressed and I didn't want to address it after we chose a leader do you know what I'm saying <laughs> Oh, that, I didn't want to. I didn't. So I those, didn't. Are, those are second readings. I'm talking about the. Right, but these are all. But they're all related. I'm trying to avoid the discussion. <laughs> As my was not. Discussed. I don't want to extend the discussion. The long. Just in a very long first. A first reading is usually just a first look, and we're having a very long discussion. Yes. For the first reading, for something that isn't even really a first reading. Right. That, with with due respect to the school committee that will take our place. Again, you, some of you will be here, but I think, you're, I think you're denying them the opportunity to consider the policy twice. So, all right. So, um, do we want to move on to JJ <laughs> DM? Should we just hold off on everything until January? We should, although we've got second, second, second reading, so that's that. appropriate. Yeah, yeah. That is appropriate. <laughs> yeah. So the same. So DM. I don't know if you want to do the first reading on that. It's a very long involved policy. Is it, like we should wait. Should we wait? Yeah. Okay. Since the true first reading is 
Yeah. All right, so we'll hold off on that. Um, and then the second reading and vote, we have policy BDA, the school committee organizational meeting. I know that there are some amendments um, that were going to be made. Um, yeah. So does some, um, do you want to put that on the floor? Uh, make a yeah, motion so I'd make a motion amendment. to adopt yeah. policy BDA as presented. Mm -hmm. as a vote. So second that. Okay. And we will wait in. Right, and so I know that Ms. Rusansky had um, recommended that we use the language from our rules of procedure rather than the language from the city charter because it's significantly clearer. Um, and after looking at it, I actually would agree with that. Um, so I would like to make a motion to amend the first paragraph to read. Um, the first meeting following an inauguration shall be an organizational meeting during which the school committee shall elect from its own member own number a vice chair who shall preside in the absence of the mayor and adopt the rules of procedure see okay uh, my only thing is that the the this term inauguration doesn't actually exist as so a you want term. okay and so um, I will withdraw I, my motion I would just say the swearing in or the seating of the council because like it could, the inauguration could be snowed out does that mean that there's no you guys can't proceed I mean inauguration is just like a ceremony it's more the actual swearing in or seating of the school committee so it's I just okay, so it's have been qualified so that's, that's the original language we use. That's kind of what it is. Yeah. So it's awkward. There's no but requirement it's for inauguration. Like there's literally, you can just take the oath at the city clerk's office and start. Well, it, so okay. Was, I'd be worried about tying it to a term that's like the inauguration. Mm -hmm. So that's all. Which is probably what the charter right. folks I, were concerned and I, about. Yeah, I understand your concern about the term around being qualified or uh, inauguration, but I think to I was really. Uh, anyway, we clearly need to make them consistent, whatever we decide between the organizational meeting uh, policy and the rules of procedure, right? Because, but uh, I was more concerned that we just clarify by saying that um, the first, it could be the first meeting following uh, school, com school committee members being qualified shall be an organizational meeting. Yeah. That is really my point. That, that's, that makes that's, sense. That, that okay. makes total sense, yeah. Great. Yeah. I right, so wanted to propose that. And then, I don't know if I have it exactly right. So, uh, so a uh, motion to amend policy BDA and change the first sentence to the first meeting following members being qualified. What's the term? Uh, shall be an organizational meeting during which the school committee shall maybe just to say that after members have uh, been sworn into office they shall okay. hold an organizational meeting like that's the, I mean that's sort yeah, of like that's really the point that implies exactly. that it's the first thing they do is hold an organizational meeting so maybe that just be more direct okay so the first meeting following uh, members being sworn in shall be an organizational meeting yes because the charter does require an oath. It does require a swearing in. Right. It doesn't require a ceremony, but it does. Right. Require. I remember Mr. Kaufman being sworn in right yep. before a meeting. Right yep. there. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. That was fast. So you're just saying swearing in and you're eliminating the regular city election? I, I just was trying to get rid of inauguration. So I just, that was No, no, concern. I'm just saying from the, from the amended, from the one, mm -hmm. from the version we presented you with. Yeah, you get sworn in after your election. <laughs> I know. I didn't know if regular city election was actually key. Yes. Necessary. Yeah. Um, I think for the whole body to organize, it's, it would be after okay. city election. So, okay. I mean, so it's really changing that. So the first meeting following. The charter following, still controls, so it still will be there. So. Yeah. Right. It says inauguration in the rules of procedure. So, but right. The first meeting following the swearing in. of members following the regular city election shall be an organizational meeting. Third versions sound better. Uh, Say again? I don't know, I'm just saying, that's fine. Did you get that down, uh, Annie, as an amendment? 
Well, there was a, uh, the first meeting after members have been sworn in following the regular city election shall be an organizational meeting. Does that make the most sense? Mm-hmm. And then I guess we have to go on to say the school committee, sh or during this meeting, the school committee shall organize, shall elect members of the school committee to serve as school committee vice chair and adopt the rules of procedure for the Northampton School Committee. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? That sounds fine. Okay. So that's an amendment. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, any discussion on the amendment? Mr. Meyer, any questions? <laughs> um, okay. No. Um, <laughs> go ahead. You know, go ahead. Well, just you could, just tie back it, now. you could tie it to the first meeting after the expiration of the previous term. You don't need to talk about swearing in or qualifications because you can't actually have a meeting of the school committee unless there's a quorum of duly qualified school committee members. So if, now again, you wouldn't want them to have an organizational meeting during the unexpired term. But if you say, and, but the expiration of the terms is set as two years following the swearing in. So I mean, you can, I mean, you can talk about it as the expiration of the previous school committee or the end of the term of the previous school committee, and just say the next meeting. But that's I'm just trying to get rid of any kind of qualification stuff. It doesn't it doesn't really matter. You, you can't have a meeting. So yeah, but it's fine. Wait. Okay. All right. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. aye. Any abstentions? Um, and then we're back to the main motion as amended. Are there any other amendments to the main motion or to the main policy, BDA? Well, I think we had a in the. Oh, sorry. You probably going to say something. Go ahead. I've said enough. <laughs> so there seems to be a contradiction between the last sentence in the first paragraph, where it says the school committee vice chair shall preside in the absence of the mayor, and then where next sentence says in the event the chair is not present. The yeah. senior member will serve That's for the organization. That's just for the organization. Just for the organizational meeting. Because the chair will be running the election for the vice chair. Right. And if the chair is not there, you still have to elect a vice chair at this organizational meeting. And if he's not there to run the election, then it's got to be this most senior member that will follow this procedure oh, to elect a vice yeah. chair. It's a, it but shouldn't we clarify that? Perhaps. See, it was it's clear to me. This is all, the yeah. policy title is organizational meeting. So it's like, it's, uh -huh. this is only a policy about the organization. I understand that, but that just further, con that last sentence in the first paragraph then also makes it sound like you're referencing the organizational meeting, right? It's sort of laying out how the organizational <laughs> meeting will be conducted. Mm -hmm. And so what happened, like for example, on the city council side, the most senior member has to do it because right. there isn't a chair or a vice chair mm -hmm. or a vice president. So like that's just how it right. happens. I understand that. On our side, there is a chair. So, but it just says if the chair is not there and there's no, there's nobody else right. been elected, then I understand senior, that. Yeah. So I'm not sure what would, to, that's what it's there for. So okay. where's the confusion? Is it later or? Well, that last sentence of the first paragraph seems to be tied into the whole how the organizational meeting will run. So maybe you should change the order of those two sentences. Okay. Maybe the last sentence should be in the event the chair is not present, the senior member you're served will act as the chair pro tem. That would, I mean, you're, anyway. I'm actually fine with just eliminating that sentence. Yeah. The school committee vice chair shall preside in the absence of the mayor. Yeah. That, that works too. That would make I, a motion. Yeah. I agree. That would work too. So to it's just defining the job of the vice chair. <laughs> yeah, right. So there's and a motion. We have another spot where that's I done. second it. Yeah, right. So that exists a, somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. yep. yep. So there's there you a go. motion Perfect. to strike that as seconded. Second. Okay. Yeah. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, Next. Anything else? So I have something else while Ms. Busanski finds what she's looking for. <laughs> I would just move that we change all vice chairs uniformly to be hyphenated and capitalized. Yes, please. Thank you. Or definitely the capitalization thing. But definitely the hyphenated. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, I thought of my next. I need a second on Oh, second. 
to hyphenate and capitalize. capitalize yes. Are you going to call for a vote? Uh, yeah, I am. I'm just going to check one thing as we're. Oh, voting. you think it's wrong? No, no, I'm not thinking it's wrong. <laughs> oh. I'm just saying that <laughs> because we have a lot of policies, we've made that mistake. Sure. On so that. all those, I may I reserve the right to reamend it. But all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Excellent. Any other? Um, any other? Um, well, so the charter does not have it hyphenated. I'm sorry to say. Uh oh. So the state law creating the chair and vice chair does not have it hyphenated. So, but we can do it. It's fine. We're 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 academics, so we'll. You know what? Honestly, over. as long as it's all the same in one policy, I don't That's even fine. care. That's fine. But we have it both ways That's fine. in the so same make policy. It That's fine. Other um, other amendments. Oh, okay, Ms. Pisansky. Uh, really more question. I'm just wondering under the uh, uh, the executive secretary's paragraph, the school committee shall, why do we annually appoint? Do we actually annually appoint? Why wouldn't it be every term, just like the vice chair? The, it says the school committee shall annually appoint an executive secretary, right, which we, is Dr. Provost, who then refers that to Annie. Mm -hmm. um, I like, I like striking the annu word annually. Yeah. I just have it be every right. two words. That's my every two uh, years. Yeah, that's part of motion to amend yeah. that and yeah. strike annually. Okay. All right. There's a motion made to strike the Second. word annually. Is it seconded? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any upset? Motions. Okay. Any other amendments? Hearing none. All those in favor of the main motion to approve BDA, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So BDA is approved. All right. Finally, BDB. So BDB um, is school committee officers, and um, it's also not quite aligned. Um, we would like to. Um, sorry, I'm missing a piece of paper. Um, We would like to amend it to read, uh, the mayor shall be a voting ex officio chairperson of the school committee as presiding officer at all meetings of the committee. The chairperson will have, and then go on with the same language that we already had. Um, the changes that we're proposing were in number two, consult with the superintendent and the vice chair. <sighs> we just need to make a decision about that hyphen and the planning of the committee's agendas. Um, re, um, removing in number four appoint subcommittees uh, the portion where it says subject to committee approval because that has practice um, in number six we are asking to remove that um, because our practice has been to have the vice chair service spokesperson for the school committee um, that was something that we did not necessarily all agree on in subcommittee um, the MASC policy just for full disclosure, does have the chair serving as spokesperson of the school committee. Um, and then under number seven, as presiding officer at all meetings of the committee, the chair will, we just removed the word all. Uh, we said answer parliamentary inquiries because we do also have a parliamentarian. Um, under duties of the vice chair, um, we added language to say the vice chair will be public spokesperson for the committee at all times, except as this responsibility is specifically delegated to others by the committee. We added in a legal reference. Um, we added in a reference to Article 4 of the city charter. It's technically 4.2, but it is Article 4, um, and added in a legal reference. Um, and I think those are all of the changes. Like I said, we just wanted to make sure all of our policies, practices, and the city charter were aligned. And it is a second reading, so I would move that we um, accept policy BDB as amended. Second. Okay. Could I ask for one amendment, um, or someone to consider an amendment, and that is just the, you use the term chairperson twice mm -hmm. in the first sentence, and then everywhere else it's chair. And the charter is chair. It says chair instead of chairperson on my notes. Well, because I raised so, it under first reading. I so. definitely would yeah. do that. So yeah. just so that it would be mm -hmm. chair throughout. And okay. So is that your motion? I would like someone to make the motion. The chair doesn't usually make motions, but if someone would make that motion. That I'll works. move that we replace chairperson with chair. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Is there any? Oh, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Um, I would. I don't 
don't exactly know how to do this, whether it's a, a motion or not, but I would like to suggest we consider the Downey Meyer rule and put this off until the third meeting. And the reason behind that is that if we can, is you know, uh, number two so it says consult with the superintendent. The chair consults with the superintendent and vice chair in the planning of the committee's agendas. We just had a conversation that that might undergo some changes. So locking that in seems, it, it seems like we should wait. More so, I think the duties of the vice chair is something that um, my new colleagues should also have a say in. So it just doesn't feel like the timing is right in the same manner that we talked about involving other people for this particular aspect of it, I think uh, I would make a motion to delay well, this? Is that well, possible? yeah, that would be the only acceptable motion right now because we're actually debating an amendment, but you could make a motion to postpone consideration of the matter. You could do that. That would be the one way to just to sort of stop everything and say postpone consideration. Second. Okay, so there's a second. It's fine. Is there any uh, further discussion on the motion to postpone? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So the motion postponed. I want to thank Mr. Meyer for that rule. That's his legacy. Okay. <laughs> That's his legacy. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so now we have um, the business administrator's report followed by the personnel report. So in your package, uh, the business report includes the report for the fiscal 20 appropriations through November 30th. There's a few areas that have deficits that I've detailed in the report for you. And I've those with administrators and transfers in the process of being completed. Um, if you have any questions about the financial report, I'll be glad to answer them. There are no gifts this month that were accepted for $1,000 or less under your policy. And there are actually two warrants that have signed during November by your representatives. Any questions about the business uh, administrator's report? Okay. Okay, now we'll go to the superintendent's report. Thank you. I would like to thank the departing committee members for the support they've offered during their tenure. Most of you were present for the adoption of the district improvement plan that expires in June. And I'd like to take a minute to recap our accomplishments during the implementation of the plan. These are among the most tangible contributions I feel you've made to the students of Northampton. Together, we have provided comprehensive anti-bias training. And I don't know if this is directly connected, but we had a conversation tonight about the importance of examining our own bias and trying to dismantle the um, institutional racism that we have within our district. But I'll just say prior to the implementation of the plan, there is a 15 percentage point gap between the four-year graduation rate of Hispanic and Latino students and their white peers at Northampton High School. As of 2018, the gap had been reduced to less than 8%. So. That's an important accomplishment. As Mr. Whalen said at the beginning, there's an incredible economic impact that has on kids. That's a really strong move in favor of economic justice, in my opinion. We've strengthened the supports for English language learners. Together, we've reduced the student to teacher ratio for ESL instructors in all schools. Most notably at Bridge Street School, where the ratio was reduced from an irresponsible 100 to 1 ratio to uh, probably still too high but more manageable 17.5 to 1. We've implemented an RTI mod, uh, model that provides early intervention for reading, math, and social emotional issues. It will take years for the full effect of this to be felt in all grade levels but the results are already apparent in elementary grades where the percentage of students identified as having a disability has dropped from 40% to 24% in grade three. And I'll say, in all the rest of these things, I'm looking forward from 2014 to the current. Um, when I looked at that year, 2014, the, the ratio was 39 and I said, that must be wrong. That must be some kind of outlier. So the 40 I gave you was actually 2013. That was the trend. That's where we were. Um, so that's had an incredible impact. Um, and that will pay dividends for years to come. Um, as we were talking at the um, 
at the Budget and Property Subcommittee meeting earlier today. As we look at projections, it looks like the numbers are even lower um, for the instance of students with disabilities in the out years. So that, that is an important achievement. We established our core district values with extensive input from stakeholders from all parts of our learning community and support from UMass, we decided what we care about. Now we can say definitively that we're here to build communities of engaged students, enable students to reach their full potential, and nurture empathy, kindness, and tolerance. We've gone from having no documented curriculum to being ready to publish family-friendly friend summaries of our curriculum on our website to engage students and our families as partners in supporting children's learning at home. We've implemented a coaching model of professional development. The person who used to sit in this seat used to talk about coaching all the time, and we had no coaches at the time. And now we have instructional coaches in both English language arts and math. Um, probably not enough. There's probably more work to be done there. But still, that's an accomplishment for this group. Through the scheduling, through scheduling and the use of substitute teachers and the collective bargaining agreements, we created time for teacher collaboration so they can share best practices and enhance their collaboration with each other. And then we've also made many improvements that were not included in the district improvement plan. We went from having just one school, the high school, with a very glitchy Wi-Fi system and a hodgepodge of unauthorized hotspots and all the rest of the buildings that were constantly crashing the network to a system where I can bring my Chromebook into any building and connect using a single password almost all the time. Uh, we've also implemented a full inclusion model in our elementary students, for, in our elementary schools for students with disabilities. And now, as part of the reflection we were talking about earlier, our students with disabilities outperform their statewide peer group in every elementary grade for English language arts and grades three and four in math. And I'm sure that we will make a clean sweep this year. We've also established our first innovation pathway. Um, in fact, we are the first school in this part of the state to have an innovation pathway. And we've begun to think about other pathways that could make learning more relevant to the needs of 21st century learners. We implemented a Twilight Academy. Um, as you heard Mr. Whalen speak in public comment tonight, that's something that's changing the life <coughs> of kids. Um, there are many times when I've heard people stand at that podium and make me want to cry, um, but tonight it was with joy. So, this is a very fine list of accomplishments for your resumes as elected officials. And I want to leave our returning members out of this appreciation because most of them, or many of them at least, have been along for most of this wonderful ride and have contributed in important ways. But their list of accomplishments is not complete and will continue to grow. Uh, for those of you who are leaving me tonight, I want to thank you for your partnership, your guidance, and your protection. And I would not have been able to lead this work Without your support, you should leave your post knowing that you've made a real and lasting contribution to the education of future generations. And so, now my office would like to present you with some tokens of appreciation, all of which are less than $50 <laughs> for your official duties. So, Cammy, if you would assist with that. Thank you. Thank and again, it's not really on the agenda, but we do want to take a moment to thank our departing <laughs> colleagues. Thank you. Um, if, uh, any of you want to say anything or would like to say any uh, parting remarks, we would, uh, we would surely give you the floor for a moment if you want to say anything. Mr. Meyer. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a privilege to serve um, all of you. Uh, the elected by the people of the city of Northampton to do this job. Um, I'd especially like to thank uh, Superintendent Provost. I think being a superintendent of a, of a school district is an immensely difficult job. 
anywhere in the United States, but especially in Massachusetts where the standards are extraordinarily high and the state is extraordinarily active in holding districts to those standards. And within the state of Massachusetts in the city of Northampton where um, we have a very active, involved, and intelligent uh, group of citizens who want the best for the students and um, will always be pushing us to provide that. So I have appreciated the opportunity to serve in this capacity. Sanasi? I'm just going to say thank you so much. It's been an honor to work with all of you and to serve this community. Uh, mm -hmm. I wish the new people who left. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of luck now. Um, it's really, it really has been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's an incredible thing to be trusted with um, so many really important things that public education does with and to have that trust has been really wonderful and then um, and personally it's just been great to be um, working on those things with such a really uh, you know smart and caring group of people. I wrote my remarks down and they're not long <laughs> um, because I had a lot of thought behind it and I didn't want to leave anything out or say it incorrectly so um, if you just give me a few moments um, I was thinking the next time this committee will all be in session 50% of its membership will be new and so oftentimes when we make a statement such as that I think of how do we see a glass do we see a glass half empty or half full um, certainly for me and I hope for everyone else the glass will be 100% full. Some new members and some veteran members, but a full committee nonetheless. I remember 12 years ago when I was sworn in as a school committee member, I recall a steady hand on my shoulder from a veteran school committee member. As I adjusted my tie and she pinned a boutonniere onto my jacket, I can still hear her say, now remember, that our responsibility is first to the children. As I adjusted my coat and checked my shoes, she continued by saying, our job is policy and not administrative. That's why we have the superintendent. As I took a deep breath and looked out at the stage before going on to be uh, into the public's light to be sworn in, she continued talking and she said, and you have no power as an individual school committee member unless we're in session. And remember then, you have just one vote. Lisa Minnick was with us here this evening. Those were the words that she shared with me the day that I was sworn in. I hope each and every one of you will share with the new members, just as Lisa did share with me, some words of wisdom and encouragement because I know they made me feel welcome they made me feel valued. They made me feel important. Since I announced that I wouldn't be seeking re-election, some people have asked me what my most memorable accomplishments were as a school committee member. I just tell them nothing. They laugh. I laugh. But it's kind of sort of true. I haven't accomplished anything by myself. Yet the committee has accomplished so much. I think we heard superintendent mention a lot of things. Thoughts that come to my mind over 12 years are, I've worked with five different superintendents. We have, we've, we've hired four superintendents, two interim super, superintendents, two permanent superintendents. We've maintained high level services to our students. We've adjusted programming and curriculum to better serve our students. We've made data-driven changes based on facts about our district. We've downsized the amount of buildings we oversee by surplusing the Florence Grammar School and the Fiker School back to the city. We've discussed for over a decade the late start at the high school and we never have made a change so far. The list goes on and on. I'm sure each one of you could contribute to my list as well. The point is, you see, 
our job is a very important job. It's difficult, it's exhausting, it's emotional, but it's so, so worth it. I know the work that I've done alongside this committee and superintendent, business administrator, mayor, and others, it will continue to affect the lives of thousands of people for years and years to come. Now that's something I and all of us can be proud of. Every time I come into this room and I sit in the John F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy Middle School Conference Room, his words come back to me. The words being, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. These were JFK's words. JFK's call to action for the public to do what is right for the greater good. For me, public service has been just that, a call to action. Mayor, thank you for inviting me to be part of city government for asking me to consider running to fill an empty seat for Ward 4 when you were just a counselor. I never could have imagined how rewarding public service would be. Superintendent, what a privilege it's been to work with you as you have guided our district. Your leadership and knowledge of what it is to be superintendent has allowed our students to be exposed to great learning opportunities while being supported emotionally and socially as they per pursued their education. And lastly, to the good people of Ward 4, thank you for trusting me to make what I thought were the best decisions for the children of Northampton and for your tax dollars. Your trust in me is so humbling. It's a feeling that I've never experienced before and I wonder if I'll ever feel it again. It's been an honor to, to serve this city a city I was born into, a city that I was educated in, and a city that I will continue to call my home. Thank you all so much. I will miss you all. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And again, thank you to all of our colleagues. Um, and uh, again, the feeling is mutual. We enjoyed serving with you, so thank you. Okay, um, now we have to move on to the next item on the agenda that's actually on the agenda and that is a request for an executive session um, and I would ask the vice chair I guess one of your final acts is to uh, is to make that request as a motion make a motion uh, for a request for an executive session in JFK room, room 103 under Massachusetts general law open meeting chapter 30a section 21a2 to hold grievance hearings, whereas open session would have a detrimental effect on the school's committee. The school committee is negotiating position. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So that requires a roll call vote, so I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll of the school committee. Uh, call the roll call. Mayor Jim Starkwood? Yes. Uh, Mr. Yes. Ms. Laura Fallon? Yes. Sam Hennessy? Yes. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? Yes. Mr. Downey Meyer? Aye. Mr. Howard, Howard Moore? Yes. Ms. Susan Fox? Yes. Mr. Edwards and Huff? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I need to tell the public that the school committee will now be moving into an executive session in accordance with Mass General Law. Um, I also need to tell you that we will adjourn from the executive session, so we will not be. So, thank you. We get to